by Jeff Pantanella. Narrated by Ulf Bjorklund. 1. Sekka The archdevil approached the prison door from a long corridor festooned with the bones of her enemies. It was a menagerie of sorts, dedicated to the souls used to feed her powerful and still growing empire, but one that had been brought dangerously close to the brink of disaster by a single man. She thought back at the long centuries it had taken to rebuild her strength, all because of him. She reflected momentarily on her prisoner, one being who had thwarted her plans of conquest in the mortal realm. She wasn't even sure how he had managed to gain access to her homeworld of Gathos after her fall. It was said nothing could travel between the three realms, since the immortal mother had created the Amaranthine barrier. And she should know. She had tried and failed many times to return to the land of mortals after she had been banished. It's an intriguing riddle to be solved for another time, she said and tapped the ornate box she held in her hand. But this time it will be different, now that I have the proper means to lay the foundation for my return. She inserted her key into the well-worn lock of the dented and filthy cell door, and pushed it through the lock's tumbler until it settled into place with a heavy thunk. The sound echoed back the depths of the lonely passage. The door swung open and flooded the prison cell with cold light. The prisoner released a painful gasp, but his head remained heavy on his chest. She saw him as she had left him, a trophy hanging from the wall. His wrists were shackled and spread wide by chains hammered into the stone wall behind him. He turned his head to shield his one remaining eye from the blinding light. He was not a handsome man, and worse to look at now that his face was swollen and bruised. He was bald except for a top knot that grew from the back of his head. The coils of the braided hair were frayed, tangled, and twisted. She glided forward into the cramped cell. She wore a luxurious ice-blue gown that opened at her navel and widened across her front, like a plunging, wavy dagger. It was elegantly embroidered along its curvy edges. Her shapely neck rose from a fountain of white sable clasped at her throat. The bottom ruffles of the gown swished upon the thin layer of fresh blood which coated the floor. She left a trail of crimson snakes in her wake. An intricate alabaster headdress rested on her head. It blended gracefully with her long white mane of hair. A fiendish crown was made of hundreds of human bones and revealed the truth of her nature. Tiny skulls of infants dangled down her back and mingled with the long strands of her stark hair. Her headpiece clattered and knocked as the smaller pieces spun with her movements and clashed together. She wore it as if the three kingdoms of Hannah already bowed down to her as their beloved monarch eager to pay homage to her with their very souls. And that was precisely what she intended. She moved as if part of a breeze toward a small table in the corner. It was cluttered with instruments of torture. This mess just won't do, she said, shaking her head. She brushed the iron pincers and sharp-edged tools aside, casting them unceremoniously to the stone floor in a cacophonous clatter. She gently placed the box she carried on the table's surface. Her black nails tapped out a simple rhythm over its top. She wore gaudy rings covered in precious stones on her fingers. The facets caught the light and created a dazzling kaleidoscope of color against the walls, though the onyx stone on her left index finger refused to join the celebration of light. The stone greedily devoured the light rather than reflect it with its sisters. The angles of her face sat high on her long serpentine neck. She looked him over with dark, iris-less eyes. He was helpless. His abused body shivered underneath the tatters of his once cobalt blue robes. The cloth was now soiled and faded. The masonry of the wall he hung from was lined with deep cracks. She thought the macabre stencil of aged stone meshed very well with the sharp lines of his ruined flesh. She swept toward him, wearing a devilish grin of satisfaction. She stopped intimately close to his body and breathed in a deep draught of his stench. It was an intoxicating fragrance to her senses. 
she had been thrown a morsel of luck, and she intended to exploit it to the fullest of its measure. She had longed for this moment for over a thousand years. It would serve as the leverage she needed to defeat her rivals, and he had practically showed up on a doorstep. Oh, this was rich. Her thick indigo lips parted ever so slightly as her excitement grew. She imagined the suffering he would endure when he discovered the full magnitude of her intentions. It was a just punishment for interfering with her plans of conquest so many years ago. And today was the day of reckoning. He was now her prisoner. Her gaze swept over his stretched and suspended body, which somehow still managed to resist the harsh lashes and probing cuts of her chief tormentor, the demon witch Chidepe. She lowered her head and raised playfully seductive eyes toward her unlikely benefactor. Her mocking interest was a cruel reminder of her duplicitous nature. She gripped his chin with slender fingers and forced him to look back at her. Eight, Nos, my dear, why such a dour face? Are you not happy to see me again? <laughs> she chuckled mockingly. Perhaps my flavor of hospitality is not to your liking. She moved even closer to his body and dropped her hand to glide along his quivering flesh. I'm surprised you haven't called you winged playmates to rescue you. Snap, snap, and here they come, ready to save the day. She sneered at him. But not this time and not here, for Gothos is the place where angels come to die. Athenus twisted his neck away from her and whispered out her name in a sorrowful sigh. Sika. A wicked smile played across her oversized mouth. She dragged her fingers across his tormented flesh, angling pointed nails into the dark burgundy welts already covering his body. New lines of bright red beaded on his skin. She glanced down at the three small beasts at her feet. The creatures feasted on the dripping life fluid of her prisoner. She kicked one to the side and it became animated with excitement, as if her action was an acknowledgement of tenderness. The others howled back at her in earnest. I am hoping they sing a song of joyful despair to the innocence you have failed. Alas, who can understand such beasts? Nonetheless, I am forever grateful to you for coming to my home as you did. I assure you, if I could go to you on my own accord, I would have returned to your doorstep ages ago. But such fanciful ideas are no longer the way of things. And sadly, one must accept the rules of the game as they change. She took a step backward, admiring Shadipe's work. I imagine your journey here was arduous and fraught with peril, yes? Now, tell me, truthfully, you missed me, didn't you? We have such history together, do we not? Did true love finally bring you running to my door? Or was it simply the desire to lay with one not so innocent of the flesh? I would never, Aetanos said. Oh, do stop with all this self-righteous dignity. The heavenly shine of your soul has dimmed. I can see that clearly enough. Aetanos showed no spark of life. His body hung deflated like a condemned and forsaken man. Come now, you look disheartened. What did you expect? A parade? A brows furrowed, and she glared intensely at the monk. You cheated when you called the angels for help and cost me centuries of accumulated mortal soul energy. I should have rivaled the power of the Great Three by now, but no, you had to interfere. You left me weak on Gothos. Do you have any idea how much favor I needed to call do just to survive? Seca brought her hands down to the edges of her open gown and traced the exposed parts of her breasts with her two small fingers. Her black nails traveled down to her midsection, leaving racist-thin lines of blue malice in her translucent skin. But survive I did. <laughs> she giggled. How bitter I must sound. One must play their part, and I do so love mine. Isn't that what you preach? All things in their natural way or some such nonsense? Seca played absent-mindedly with the blood that bubbled up from the cuts. 
It was one of her favorite pastimes. She drew a blue line across his cracked lips, then licked her fingers clean, one by one. She savored every drop. Her wounds closed immediately, leaving no trace of the incision. Then she grabbed his flaccid cock roughly. Her eyes widened with anticipation, and she inadvertently wet her lips with her tongue. He released a low moan as his meat filled with blood. You cannot fool me. You thought to break me again, but I did not see Nizzes Z die in your hands when you arrived. Has the fire serpent abandoned you as well? Or did you think to use this righteous scepter instead of the fiery sticks? Seca tightened her grip on his member and shook it repeatedly. Do you hope to turn me to the light? Was that your plan? <laughs> Seca laughed at his discomfort. Or better yet, did you wish to possess me like one of your mind slaves? I hear you are known for choosing an unsuspecting mortal to carry out your whim, all in the name of... She observed his reaction. Not so easy, silly monk. I wouldn't dare speak her name here. Names are so important, are they not? Seca warily glanced upward and waited. Nothing. She gave Aetanos a knowing wink. There, you see, nothing to fear. She brought one hand to her mouth. Her long fingers danced over her lips. I wonder, could it be that you are here because you no longer hold favor with the little birds in their pristine halls and cloudless skies? Seca squeezed his thick member again tightly. I hate little birds. Then she released him. She swished away as if twirled by an invisible dance partner. But the reason why you are here and how you skirted the amaranthian barrier carry little importance to me now. What matters to me is that you are here and I can use you. My dear Aetanos, you have been such a thorn in my side, much like that Irritating red devil says Fander. Now, like him, you are pitiful and weak. My trap is closing over you both. Be assured you will not beat me a second time. Athenus raised his head. I am bound by way of the immortal mother. Her sight of all things flows quick as the monsoon. You have been exposed, like all things, under the sun. His breath wheezed out of his mouth. You cannot hide from her eyes, he said in a shaky voice. But I did not come for you, she laughed. <laughs> but you did. You came straight to my door. You were driven here by madness with the hopes of being a hero once more. Slay the dragon, save the helpless maiden in despair, and all that nonsense. If you succeeded, you could regain the respect of your winged friends. Maybe the little birds might even take you back. Ah, but now the dragon has you by the balls, and the maiden has vanished. Found another plaything, has she? I know. Illyria is here, prisoner, through trickery, he said. I am here to free her from your prison of lies. Seca could see he barely had the strength to speak. Yes, your passionate devotion to that angel is admirable, if not misplaced. Illyria is here and has become a favorite plaything to so many of the Dark Lords of Gathos. Much to her liking, I might add. Lies. Illyria remains pure. And you remain delusional to the end. But we have other matters to discuss. He raised his head slowly. You will get nothing from me. You cannot hide behind this glamour. Vile creature. His head dropped to his chest again. Drool laced with blood bubbled at his lips. I know what you are. Vile. I chose this attire just for you. Don't you like my appearance? Tempting, is it not? She traced the heavily embroidered silk lace and stroked the white ermine at its edge. 
She gave Aetanos a dramatic pout. I'd like our time together to be enjoyable. I simply thought this form would be more pleasing to you, Seka said with an impish smile. Her tone was seductive. She grabbed his chin again. Look at me. Do I not entice you? There are other, more aggressive forms I can take if you like. You've seen them before. Her fingers teased down his stomach again and traced his exposed manhood. She cradled its length gently in her palm. I see the angels didn't squeeze all mortal desire from you during your transformation. The boundless is my truth. It will save me from your temptations. He shook his head. His voice was barely a whisper. It is my truth. I will tell you what is true, great monk. Me, I am the truth. The fury in her voice magnified in a small chamber. I am the cold in the air. I am the frost on the ground. The power of Gathos is mine. The flames of the red devil would not have this land. Ethan smiled. Says Vander reproaches. Once more. In strength, the game board grows broader. She finally heard the quiet confidence in his voice that she so despised. You know nothing. Her black eyes blazed with hatred and she clenched her jaw. How could he know? Her body shook with rage, causing the skulls and bones on her headdress to thrash together. She stopped at the table and marshaled her emotions. But enough of this seriousness. Your hallowed serenity is all I desire, my dear. And so I have brought you this gift in appreciation for our time together. I crafted it specifically for you and your unique nature. Seka opened the lavish box and took out a small, exquisitely detailed amulet. The jeweled piece was attached to an intricately woven chain. Carve upon each link were hundreds of hard-edged symbols. Her face was close to his when she placed it around his neck. She lightly caressed his cheeks with both hands and kissed him hard against the lips as she pushed his head away. His arms stretched to take on the weight of the amulet. Its small size belied its burden. The charm began to glow a putrid green as it throbbed against his bare chest like a second heart. Seka stepped back, appreciating the beautiful work of her craftsmanship. It's perfect, just as I hoped. She shut the lid of the box, closing it with a click. She then moved toward the chamber door. Seka stopped at the entrance and glanced back at Athanos. You cannot fathom the boon you have given me by coming here. And for that I am grateful. The legions of Gothel shall sacrifice uncounted mortal souls on temples raised in your honor. Your name will be worshipped throughout eternity. Seka slammed the heavy door shut. She leaned her back against its cold metal. A smile came quickly as the great monk began to chant. The typical melodic tones and overlapping harmonies were replaced by sound patterns of pleading desperation. It was music to her ears. There was just one more piece to connect. When it fell into place, she would ascend higher than any archdevil before her in the timeless history of the abyss. Her nemesis, the red devil, Sis Fander, would become an afterthought. That's it. Call to your mind, slave. Raise the next ever hero and seal the fate of the mortal realm into everlasting doom. Seka left the monk to his work, for she had much to prepare. Race down the polished stone corridors of the Zazen Hall. His top knot of braided black hair whipped like an angry viper behind his head. Light from rows of beeswax candles gleamed off the rest of his shiny scalp. He did his best to run silently, but his loose brown robes billowed like sheets in the wind. He was sure the noise could wake the dead. The young monk had removed his sandals at the entrance to the Zazen Hall, as was customary. His wool socks slid more than stepped on the smooth stone. He was late to morning meditation again. Why he couldn't finish his darn chores on time as the rest of his brothers, 
was a mystery to him. Master Dore would not be pleased. Guess I hoped the red doors leading into the meditation hall would still be open. With a bit of luck, he could sneak in without notice, but the doors were already closed. A sigh of disappointment escaped his lips. I'm not even that late. He gripped the door ring and pulled slowly. Quiet as a mouse now, not a sound. The dry hinges refused to listen, and with an agonizingly slow creak, they shattered the silence of the room. Kasai scrunched his shoulders and grimaced. He then peered into the dimly lit room. Inside, forty-three monks sat in quiet meditation. Their ages ranged from child to young adult. Just like Kasai, each had been brought to the monastery as a young child by a traveling master. The monastery offered orphaned and abandoned children a home and family when they otherwise would have none. Their life was not easy. The monks were deprived of many of the luxuries of the big cities, but it was safe. Each monk wore a formal top-knot style as befitted the order, or chose to shave off all their hair. They were dressed in sleeveless shirts and sat in dark brown leggings tucked underneath thin off-white socks. During the colder months, they wore loose, rusty orange robes that billowed in the mountain winds. Some had removed their outer robes, which were folded neatly on the floor before them. A few scattered candles threw a slight warm glow upon their still bodies. Master Dore, one of the three masters of Ordo, was seated upon a raised platform. He was draped in simple blue robes. His head was upright, but his face remained in shadow. Master Dore stopped his lesson and turned his smooth head toward Kasai. Stay shut, stay shut. Kasai silently pleaded as he stood like an awkward silhouette in front of the open door. Master Dore's eyes flashed open. The master's cold stare and disapproving frown told Kasai everything he needed to know about how he felt about tardiness. This was going to be a bad day. Please have a seat, Brother Kasai. We have been waiting for you, Master Dore said. The tone of his voice was neutral. This was another bad sign. Nothing to do about it now, Kasai thought. He shuffled across the room to his subaton, located three rows from Master Dore's platform. Kasai plopped down on his small square mat and joined the rest of his brothers in meditation. Master Dore continued his lesson. All things are contained within the boundless, yet the boundless remains invisible to eyes that are blind, ears that are deaf, and hands unable to touch. The mountain filled with stones and the trees that grow in its earth is part of the boundless. The water that flows in a stream, the air that blows in the wind, and the fire that burns, but lights our way, are all the same. When you are one with the boundless, you will see, hear, and feel the vibrations of their essence. You make more noise than a raccoon caught in the pantry. I heard you coming as far away as the dormitories, Brother Daku whispered from Kasai's right side. Daku was eighteen and a year older than Kasai, though the masters discouraged discussing a person's age in numbers. The masters said it was a self-defeating idea, used to count the days left in life, rather than the accomplishments that lay ahead. His muscular body could have been sculpted from stone. His face was sharp and angular in the same way. He looked like a living granite statue in the king's courtyard. Master Dore will not go lightly on you this time. I know, I know, Kasai sighed. Who was assigned to grease the door hinges this month? Me, <laughs> Daku snickered. Thanks, friend. Kasai shut his almond-shaped eyes and concentrated on Master Dore's lesson. The monk sat according to rank throughout the hall. The more advanced acolytes occupied the front row, while the younger, less experienced initiates sat in rows extending to the rear of the room. The master continued. Through the boundless, you will share the gift of understanding with all things, for all things are alive with vibration. Their thoughts will be your thoughts. Their actions, your actions. Their energy shall be your energy, and you shall give all of yourself in return. This is the openness. It is a bond of truth. When you free yourself from misery, from hate and revenge, you will be ready to embrace the boundless. Do not fear the unknown. 
for within the unknown is the seed for growth. The master remained silent for a time. He breathed out slowly. Kasai heard the platform boards creak as the master stood. Contemplate what you have learned today, for it will help you in the future. Tomorrow, the test of pillars await the senior initiates. Kasai cracked open his eyes. He watched Master Dory slowly pad to the door that led to his private chambers. His pace was agonizingly slow. Lucky, 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 Kasai whispered with each of the master's steps. Master Dory stopped at the door. Brother Kasai, I shall have a word with you in my chamber when you have finished. Kasai slumped on his sabaton. He wasn't looking forward to meeting with Master Dory. The old monk was known for his stringent punishments. Kasai hoped he would not be forced to choose between two impossible tasks again. That was a special torture. Once, he had to choose between balancing on one leg for a day and night, or sitting naked in the snow until the morning sun was overhead. He now hated the coal with an extraordinary passion. Kasai shook his head. Why must I always be late? Two hours later, a bell chimed three times. Morning meditation had ended. Kasai got up and walked with heavy steps to Master Dore's private chambers. Daku jogged over to him before he reached the door. Daku was in a jolly mood and put his armor on Kasai's shoulder. It's at least two hands width taller than most of the brothers at the monastery. Daku enjoyed looking down on others, especially Kasai. Cheer up, little brother. This was only the third time you were late this month, Daku jested. He rarely, if ever, used the title brother with any of the monks of the order. I don't think that warrants anything too severe. Really? Kasai said, hopefully. No, not really. You'll pull midnight watch for sure this time. Just think of it. You, alone on the North Ridge, the heavens are full of stars. The cold wind is blowing, but there's no fire to warm you. Ugh. I hope you have properly mastered the deeper fire Zindu forms. You know I haven't, Kasai sighed. And only the cause of the Vargru to keep you company, Daku added. You'll know when they are close, because their howling changes to maniacal laughter. That's not true, Kasai said. His voice cracked with a hint of fear. The Vargru keep to the lower forests. <laughs> if you say so, Daku chuckled. I'll be with Jamo and Risu in the courtyard. Meet us after. Daku left the meditation hall with the rest of the monks. Kasai turned to the side door. This always happens to me. Why am I so unlucky? He sighed once more as he grabbed the handle. A short time later, Kasai entered the outside courtyard. He dragged his feet and wore the expression of a man resigned to a harsh fate. Brothers Jimu, Risono, and Daku joined him. Will it be an extra hour or two sweeping the outer steps? Or did Master Doria go hard on you? Jamu said teasingly. Jamu was small and round and, like Risono, was similar in age to Kasai. He was built like a cannon shot, which earned him the name Cannonball from his friends. His shaved head and puffy cheeks gave him the appearance of having a second, smaller ball precariously balanced on his rounded shoulders. But not even Daku could move Cannonball from the center circle once he crouched in a static basket position. Kasai tried unsuccessfully to smile. Master Dorhe fully expressed his disapproval with me for being late. I was granted a month's worth of midnight sentry duty on the North Ridge, Kasai said. Jamu and Risuno grimaced and moaned. I knew it! Daku's dark eyes flashed with excitement. He pointed his finger at Kasai. It's not more than you deserve. I will teach you not to be late. Be thankful it's still early autumn and you did not draw winter duty, Risuno said. I'd hate to be out all night in the middle of December. Risuno wrapped his long arms around his thin body. His frame was the opposite of Jamu. It was just a few fingers shorter than Daku, but skinny as a reed. His body could move like a length of rope, which made him difficult to hit in a fight. I didn't say guard duty started tonight, Kasai's shoulders slumped. Oh no, Rison said. Daku laughed. Served you right, Kasai. You're always late. Knowing you, you'll be late for your own funeral. Speaking of funerals, 
We face the pillar test tomorrow. I didn't think it would be this soon. I'm not ready. What if it's a cloudy day tomorrow? We won't be able to see where we're going, Cannonball said. He repeatedly bit into his worn fingernails. Rasona nodded in agreement. Daku scoffed at their nervous reactions. Finally, we're given a true test. I'm eager to pit my Zindu energy against something real. Tired of practicing lame tricks over and over again. Hot hands, cold hands, hot feet, cold feet. None of this is like fighting in the real world. I'm ready for challenge. Daku was in a boastful mood today. When was he not? Kasai thought. Cannonball wasn't as confident. I overheard two of the senior monks saying to Brother Maru that if you fail here, you won't be able to ascend to the higher ranks. He craned his head toward the clouds. How far up do you think they go? The pillar test is not meant to be completed by initiates. It was designed to help open us to the boundless, Rizuno said. He hid his hesitation behind a more scholarly approach. Master Kunshin posted a scroll of who shall go tomorrow. We are the first four to attempt the challenge. I thought it wouldn't happen for another season after we had more training, Kasai said. Rizuno and Cannonball stared uncertainly at each other. What a bunch of warriors. I'll race you all to the finish, Daku said. And I'll win, no question. It's not a competition, Daku, Kasai said. Yes, it is. It always is, Daku said with a twisted smile. He turned to walk toward the sparring grounds. I need to practice a new low kick combination. One of you come with me. Kasai and Risuna shook their heads. But Cannonball fell in step behind Daku. Don't go, Cannonball, Kasai said. You'll be sorry. I need to practice too, Cannonball reluctantly said. Let him go. I'll be sorry tomorrow, Risono said. The next morning, the young monks assembled around Master Shogar at the steps of the first pillars. He stood with his arms behind his back, hands clasped behind his blue robe. His long mustache and wiry beard flowed in a smooth breeze. Master Shogar's sightless, milk-colored eyes idly gazed at four lines of pillars. Each pillar had been shaped from white marble, quarried along the lower Seriba hills. Its smooth surface glistened with dew. Master Shogar raised his voice to the group. Brother Kasai, Brother Daku, Brother Jamu, and Brother Rusuno. You four will be the first. Step on the head of the pillar at your feet. Then step to the next, and then next. Let the boundless guide you, and your path will be clear. Kasai looked to his right. Risono and Cannonball had taken their places at their respective pillars. Cannonball's fat face was filled with worry. He rubbed his left thigh. Brother Daku had not been kind in the sparring circle. Kasai looked to the pillars before him. Each column rose slightly higher than the previous one. The long line ran parallel to the bend in the hillside and out of sight. Kasai wondered why he had never really noticed them before or, or their height. Kasai, why are you waiting? Keep up, Daku said. He leaped to the fifth column, which was now at least as tall as a grown man. Kasai took the first two column steps. Easy. The sun was out and the path of column tops before him was clear. Although each new column was higher in elevation, it was the same distance from the last one. Soon he was leaping from one column to the next like Daku. This isn't much of a test. I could probably do this blindfolded, Kasai said to no one in particular. He could hear Risona and Cannonball behind him. Neither had difficulty leaping from one column to the next on their designated route. The pillars mirrored the twisting natural rock towers that populated the area. Kasai rather enjoyed the exercise, until the position of the posts became erratic. Up and down they went or jerked out of line. A gust of wind caught Kasai unaware and pushed him to one side. He almost slipped off the top and fell. Luckily, he regained his balance in time. That was close. Beads of sweat formed on his forehead. Be mindful of the wind, Kasai called out to his brothers. I am the wind, Daku said. He was at least ten pillars ahead of the others. Kasai, why so slow? Did you stop for morning tea? Show off, Cannonball yelled. Reckless is more like it, Rizona said. He was starting to huff. I never knew these pillars to be so high, Cannonball said. What do the masters think we will accomplish? What happens if we fall? Keep moving forward. Don't give in to fear, Kasai said. 
He wished he could believe his own words. The winds picked up, and with it came a clinging mist. The line of pillars became obscured. Kazai leaped to the next pillar. This time he landed firmly on its top. The entire column shook slightly under his feet, casting subtle vibrations that echoed into the air. Well, that's distracting, Kasai thought. I can't see anything with all this mist, Cannonball said. I'm getting dizzy. I'm sure to fall. Jiamu, be calm. Breathe. Remember your training. Feel the boundless, Kasai said. He hoped it would reassure Cannonball. Although, when he searched for a connection to the boundless, all he felt was the cold, wet air. I'm climbing down. This is madness. We will all fall to our deaths, Cannonball said with determined certainty. Kasai, where are you? Stay on your path. Trust yourself and keep moving forward. You will make it, Kasai said. The pillars before Kasai became ghostly silhouettes. The moist air coated the tops of the columns. Kasai willed himself forward. If Daku could do it, so could he. He leapt to the next pillar. The soles of his sandals skidded on its slick surface. His feet slid out from under him and kicked off the front of the post. He landed on his back. He instinctively locked his outstretched hands on the column's shaft. The surface of the stone was slick. Kasai found it challenging to keep his hands in one place. His eyes were wide and stared into white nothingness. He felt his heart pounding in his chest. Concentrate on the air around you, Master Shogar called out from somewhere below. Feel the movement of the moisture in the air. Feel its spirit. Let it define the form of the pillars. Trust your inner sight to guide your next step and leap. But Master, if we fall, Cannonball said. His voice was like a distant echo to Kasai now. Do not let the fear of the unknown prevent you from seeing the truth, Master Shogar said. Believe in the path Aetinus has set for you. He will guide you, but you must open your eyes and see. I cannot see anything, Cannonball's voice was shaky and small. If you cannot see with your eyes open, close them and embrace the boundless, Master Shogar said. I'm afraid. Afraid or not afraid, the outcome is the same. Now jump, Master Shogar's voice drifted into the wind. Kasai had hardened his body through countless hours of physical training over the years at Ordu. He had been exposed to harsh weather conditions on the open mountain. But somehow, this was worse. The air was cold and raw, and it drained his strength. Fear caused his muscles to tremble. Remember your training, Kasai said to the sky. He surrendered to the impossible situation he was in and let the fear fade. His mind became quiet and relaxed. Somehow, he needed to help Cannonball, because I could sense the conflict raging in his friend's thoughts. Brother, calm your mind. Relax, Kasai shouted from his back. But as usual, Cannonball refused to listen to good advice. He jumped impulsively to the next column, but never landed on its top. Kasai heard a desperate yell falling until the white mist consumed it. Cannonball fell, Rusona shouted. Kasai could tell his friend was close to breaking. Master Shogar's calm voice returned. Do not let the darkness consume you with fear. All is not as it appears in the physical world. Follow the path of light set by Athenos. See it. Reach out to it and it will take your hand. I don't see any hands, Risono said. Risono, calm down, Kasai called out. Kasai, I can't see a thing. Where are you? I am here, brother. Do as Master Shogar has instructed. Kasai gathered his strength. He righted himself on the column top. His legs were unsteady as he stood. Breathe in, breathe out. Kasai twisted his head to the right. Concentrate on my voice. No. Forget it. I'm done. I'm climbing down. There's no shame in being safe. Climb down with me. Risono, steal your mind and calm your heart. You must move forward. No way. I'm not crazy like you and Daku. I have nothing to prove. Kasai heard Risono struggle to lower himself over the edge of the pillar. Risono, don't do it. The columns are too slick. But it was too late. 
Rasona's scream echoed throughout the pillars as he fell. Kasai felt sick to his stomach. What sort of fatal test was this? Climb down and fall? Move forward and fall? Where was Daku? How had he escaped this fate? Kasai was suddenly gripped with panic, with his breath held tight in his lungs. Finally, Kasai let out a deep exhale. He steadied himself once more. Okay, I can do this. He exhaled deeply again and finally felt calm. He balanced on his left leg so he could slip off his right sandal. Kasai tossed it into the mist along with the wet sock he peeled off his foot. The stone was cold and wet on his bare foot, but he could feel it, and that was reassuring. Kasai removed his other sandal and sock in the same manner. He then pressed his toes into the stone surface. If I am to meet my end, then I shall do it moving forward. Kasai was ready. He leaped for the next pillar, but came up short. He just managed to catch the edge of the surface with his toes. Luckily, his momentum carried him forward enough to regain his balance. Kasai's heart was in his throat. His entire body trembled. He scanned the air in front of him, but could barely see the next pillar. He tried to keep himself calm. I must not fear this test. Aetanus shall guide me. Kasai shook his head in doubt. The air shifted, and the mist blew in his face. The wet air blinded him. It was cold, silent, and suffocating. His temples throbbed like thunder at the sides of his head. His breath was quick. His eyes stood as still as he could. He closed his eyes and forced himself to be calm. He wanted to believe that Aetinos would guide him, but what proof did he have? The great monk did not guide the path of his brothers. How could he let them fall? These initiates were his monks. They represented the living symbols of the man who achieved enlightenment and rose to defeat evil at the height of its power. And where was the guiding light of Aetinus when he was six years old? His pa was a true believer in Aetinus, but still he abandoned Kasai and his ma to the darkness. Wasn't that the reason he had come to Ordu? He ached for the comfort of his ma now. She had died that fateful day but he still felt the loss as if it had just happened. Kasai drew a deep breath and exhaled. He would not rely on an absent figurehead to save him. He had done that once when he was six, and it had cost him so much. I'm climbing down. Maybe I'll have better luck than Rizuno. This is crazy. The boundless is not real. I don't want to die. Trust me, my son. A soft voice came into his head. Father, Kasai said into the mist, I will guide you. Again, the voice whispered within his thoughts. It was like a familiar memory. Kasai thought he saw the image of a moon or egg fawn form in the mist. Then it dissolved away. Kasai shook his head. He cannot be my father. He would not be here now. He will be somewhere safe. Believe in me, and I will guide you. I can do this on my own. Then you shall fall. No, I won't. Kasai leaped forward and landed on the next pillar, but his heels slid fast straight off the slick surface. Kasai felt his head connect with a hard surface. He saw a quick, bright flash, and then he was one with the air. Kasai's vision cleared to a dull blur. Somehow he was alive. His head ached. It felt like his brain had swollen and was pushing against his eyeballs. He felt the rough texture of hemp rope crisscrossing his body. The voices below him grew louder. Kasai crawled to the edge of the safety net and lowered himself down to solid ground. Daku was the first to greet him. Did you enjoy your little nap? How long have I been up there? Kasai said. He rubbed away the stiffness in his arms and legs. Who cares? I was the last to fall. I nearly made it to the end. Kasai looked dubiously at his friend. Although he had lost sight and sound of Daku, he doubted his friend could have lasted much longer than he did. But what did it matter? The pillars were impossible for anyone to complete. Kasai realized the point of the lesson was to be exposed to the impossible and contemplate what it was not. Kasai wished he had known about the safety nets earlier. But then his attempt to reach the boundless would have been insincere. He needed to learn to trust the unknown. Come on, let's watch the next group. 
They don't know about the Nets either. I bet nobody gets even close to my record, Daku said. He ran ahead. I'm sure they won't, brother, Kasai continued rubbing his arms. He was simply happy to be alive. 3. Shivering Fulcaran Keep was an ancient castle. It was built long ago, on the backs of the conquered after the invasion of the warlord, Barak Shiverick from the east. The castle was the first of its kind to be built in the untamed wilderness. Within a generation, the families of the invading warriors flowed beyond the keep's wall and settled closer to the sea. The port city of Githam was established and served as the entryway into untapped trade opportunities for the homeland across the sea. Fulcrum Keep had been the seat of power for the kingdom of Barokia and the home of House Shiverig for countless generations. War banners of deep rose and purple hung from the ceiling rafters within the keep's great hall. A heavy cloth fluttered in a lacy dance of heat billowing from the blazing fire against the wall. Duke Geron Shiverig, the last scion of the Shiverig bloodline and heir to a usurped throne, sat at a long table and brooded over unpleasant news. He raised his eyes to King Mortimer Conrad's court messenger. The young boy's face showed a hint of impatience, which further infuriated Duke Shiverick. Again, Mortimer sinks his jackal teeth into my flesh. The man means to bleed me dry. Your answer, my lord, the messenger said. The boy possessed the same arrogance as the king. He spoke as if he commanded a hundred knights at his back. No. The answer was more of a growl than a word. My pardon, my lord? What? I said no! Duke Shiverig pounded his oversized fist on the massive oak table. The force of the blow shook the clay jugs filled with dry wine from the plains of Western Barokia. Exotic fruit wobbled in their shallow bowls, freeing an orange to drop from its stack and rolled across the table. Duke Shiverig eyed it menacingly and then swatted it across the room. Shadows from the fire rippled across his smooth scalp. His anger took on the fiery aspect of the blaze. The short whiskers that made up his dark-trimmed beard stood out like the raised hackles of a beast. I will not be dictated by that fool Mortimer Conrad and his council of dim-witted sycophants. I refuse to acknowledge him as the rightful king of Barokia, Duke Shiverick said. He stood abruptly. His legs tangled with the chair until he kicked it away as if he was an angry mew. He was a colossal man and moved like an apex predator. Shivering circled the young messenger, whose eyes were now wide with fear. For twenty-two years I have endured this impostor who poses like a king on my father's stolen throne. And now he looks to weaken my family's house even further by stealing more men. Yes, my lord. The boy bowed in acquiescence. He was trembling when he rose. I mean, the king wishes to have you formally acknowledge the demands of his letter, sir. Duke Shivering stopped his rampage. He turned to the tall stone columns that supported the rafters. Malachi, come out where I can see you. This is your responsibility. You are supposed to be managing this. Archvashim Malachi stepped out of the shadows in burgundy ropes with the copper trim. Malachi was a tall man. He was narrow at the shoulders with angular features and penetrating eyes. He bowed in silence before Duke Shiverick. I am here, my lord. It would seem impolite not to reply in some way to King Conrad's letter. Ideally, he will wish to know that you have complied with his command. Duke Shiverick's eyes grew wide with amazement. I know that! He twisted back to the messenger. The quickness of his movement belied his considerable bulk. He looked for something to break. The messenger would do. A symbol of my obedience is needed, yes? His slate-gray eyes narrowed on the messenger like a lion eyeing a rabbit. Duke Shiverig pulled a long knife from the belt at his waist and watched the messenger's complexion pale. The boy took a few steps backward. A simple word of acknowledgement would do, my, my lord, the messenger stuttered. My lord, Malachi spoke in soothing tones. Perhaps this is not the ideal message to send at this time. It is a message that is long overdue, Malachi, Duke Shiverick said. 
He looked over the messenger's body with hungry eyes. I'll carve it into the lad's flesh. Malachi moved past Duke shivering like a specter. He laid a bony hand on the messenger's shoulder. Please inform King Conrad that Duke Jaron Shiverig, the 150th Lord bearing the Shiverig crest, is willing to do his duty to the realm. House Shiverig will send more troops to patrol the borderlands. The Knights of Gethem will end the rash of brigands' attacks against the frontier villages. See to the notary in the front chambers. He will affix the Duke's seal to the King's letter, along with my blessing. Thank you, Archvashim Malachi, the messenger said. He quickly bowed and scurried out of the room. Malachi, you overstep your usefulness once again, Duke Shiverig said. His flash temper had abated, but simmered just under the surface of control. I have no intention of sending the Knights of Gethem to protect peasants in frontier villages. My men will not be used to bolster the king's weak position in the outer territories. Let him send his reserves from Quarkov. The king is testing you, but there is a greater price to be had here than rebuking the king's wishes. In time, you will convert more of the kingdom's people to your cause than mere peasants, Malachi said in a conspirator's tone. The archvashim rounded the large table and poured two glasses of wine from one of the clay jugs. Come, let us sit and talk. Duke Shiverig remained standing, his burly arms folded across his chest. His stance was as immovable as his opinion of the king. So, you still advocate an alliance with those meddling monks? Or do you have some new scheme for me to ponder? Malachi took a sip from his glass and considered the bouquet. There are many possibilities to consider, but let us speak of the monks today. You must seek an alliance with the monks of the Four Orders, or their destruction. Either outcome would serve you well. Faith is an exquisite weapon when wielded with artful hands. Many subjects of the realm still pray for the return of Aetanos. He became a demigod after all, or so say the true believers. Malachi rolled his eyes at the lunacy that any man could ascend to godhood. His monks represent the undefinable connection to the divine in human form. That is a powerful tool to be manipulated. Most people need to believe there is something more waiting for them after their time in this world is over. Yet you have cast your die with more, the embodiment of change, chaos, and creation. He is the antithesis of the stability and lawfulness that Aetinus offers his followers. Why would you give your support to those who oppose your prophet? The masses are easily swayed, answered Malachi. There is a fine line between truth and heresy. Influence, not power, control the ideas that take shape on either side of that line. The song of Aetanos had been silent for hundreds of years. The convenient story says he has fully ascended and will never return to the mortal realm, which makes the monks the last embodiment of his legacy to this land. Win over the monks and slowly have your influence become their influence. The duke shook his head doubtfully. No easy feat. Those stubborn monks are set in their ways. They will not turn. And who knows how many still exist outside of the Temple of Illumination? The locations of their remote monasteries remain hidden, though I suspect their sanctuaries were abandoned long ago. But if we could apply political pressure on the temple and change the mindset from the top down... Malachi sipped his wine before answering. Yes, that would seem to be the solution. Unfortunately, Grandmaster Marvo Nesulo remains shackled to tradition. As we have seen repeatedly, he is steadfast in his unwillingness to become associated with any political affiliations whatsoever. Eventually, he will need to be removed. Malachi smiled at the thought and continued. For now, the prudent strategy is to stay the course. Let the despair of the land prove Aetanos has fled this world. The last blight was not so long ago that people have forgotten hardship. Let the monks become reminders of Aetanus' betrayal of the people's trust. Cast the blame for the difficulties throughout the land on them. Nobody wants to see the hard times return. And when they do, the people will need someone to blame. Either way, you are in control of the levers of influence. They will join you or they will be replaced. 
The spoils of the chaos you are advocating have taken longer to enjoy than you anticipated. As it is, I am depleting my power base by supporting Conrad's demands for more troops. This will only get worse. Duke Shivering reached for the glass of wine Malachi had poured for him. He drank deeply from the cup as if it was water. He hardly appreciated the vintage. His grandfather once said, Wine is a fancy drink for fancy men. No, I think we go for the head of the beast and work our way down. Miss Sulu must have a vulnerability, something we can exploit. He is the Grand Master of the Seventh Heaven. One does not ascend to such an elevated rank without amassing certain powers. To say he is vulnerable be a mistake, but he has been the spiritual leader of the monks of the Four Orders for many decades. No matter how noble the heart, ambition stirs the desires of those who wait impatiently in line for their turn to rule. Duke Shivering tapped the rim of the wine glass with his index finger. I do not want to disrupt the machinations of the temple. The last thing I need is a martyrdom here in Gethim. Conrad would not hesitate to use that against me. We shall work to sway Nusula to our cause, rather than remove him outright. As luck would have it, Grandmaster Nusula had deigned to come down from his lofty tower, and is eager to bend your ear to his needs. He shall arrive at Volker and keep up on the morrow. We shall see then if he is willing to listen to reason or not, Malachi said. The duke looked suspiciously at his Arkvashim. The man wore a fox's smile and was up to something. Duke Shiverig knew better than to take anything Malachi said at face value. His Arkvashim was a cunning and deceptive man with a head for politics. There was always a hidden twist to every plot Malachi hatched in his devious mind. How convenient, Shiverig said. The corridor walls, leading to the Grand Hall of Volkerum Keep, were lined with stone sculptures of legendary heroes of House Shivery. The figures displayed a decisive victory over a beaten and broken foe, and represented a powerful icon during the rise of the Kingdom Barokia. Each stone scion was twice the size of an ordinary man. The figures had been carved from a single block of Phrygian marble with masterful care. The artisans used the purple and rose veins found naturally in the rock to form the appearance of a circulatory system around the stone bodies. How Shiverick had long ago associated their rule with the enduring qualities of the rock, and took the colors for their banners and shields. The statues were also meant to be a stark reminder of how Shiverick's dominance over any who challenged their rule. The message was clear. Defy us at your own risk. The Shiverig family crest was proudly displayed on the hero's shields and armored plates. Between each sculpture hung a thick purple banner with rose trim. The symbol of a snarling mastiff was placed in its center. The animal's bared canine teeth were ferocious to behold. The first statues wore artifacts of the warlord's power and absolute rule, and the latter figures were graced with majestic crowns, except for the last one. The stone icon of Gareth Shiverick, Garen's father, wore no such article of office. Duke Shiverick waited impatiently in a majestic chair for the next petitioner to arrive. His eyes roamed the empty room looking for unseen threats. It was a habit he learned from the death of his father. An immense tapestry hung the length of the wall behind him. The meticulously crafted artwork depicted scenes of his paternal ancestors, commanding the five armies of the realm to victory. It was the backdrop he preferred when addressing the citizens of Gethem or nobles from neighboring cities. Two men stood to either side of Duke Shiverick. On his left was Arkvashim Malachi, who bent slightly to speak in Shiverick's ear. They will be along shortly. Duke Shiverick gave a gruff nod. Malachi wore his religious robes of high office for the meeting with Grand Master Nusulu. The cloth was bruised purple and flaunted gold trim around the wrists and neckline. A medallion inlaid with a faceted ruby hung heavy at his neck. The jewelry reflected myriad red hues whenever the Artrashim moved. The shivering crest was proudly displayed on the upper left side of Malachi's robe. The emblem of Moor was embroidered on the right side. The design was a haphazard pattern to symbolize the constant change of chaos. A famed knight of Gethem stood proud to Duke Shiverig's right. He was encased in light armor with a formal purple vest hanging low over his steel plate. 
He stood silent and tall. The studded mace at his hip was well-worn and easily accessible if needed. The knight's hands repeatedly flexed into fists at his sides. A page entered the entrance of the great hall to announce the arrival of Marvu Nisulu, the revered Grand Master of the Seventh Heaven, and two of his senior monks. Duke Shiverick bid them forward with a wave of his hand. He waited for what felt like an eternity for them to approach. As if time stood still for the righteous, they move slower than crawling stones, Shiverick said under his breath. Quite so, Malachi said. Pride goeth before the fall. The Grand Master and his two monks stopped at the foot of the dais and looked up at the Duke in unison, while Duke Shiverick leaned back in his chair. He appraised Nuzula with a tight smile. The man was old. He looked frail enough to be toppled by a strong wind. My Lord Duke Shiverick, we are honored to be accepted into your home and to share this time with you. We have urgent matters to discuss, Grand Master Nasulu said. A good day to you, old father, Duke Shiverick said. Please proceed. Nasulu gathered his thoughts. Everything he did was frustratingly slow. Finally, he cleared his throat and spoke. Horrendous reports continue to arrive at the Temple of Illumination. Barbarian raiders have come down from the Horfrost Mountains and sacked frontier villages. Brigands roam unchecked across the grasslands. Even the streets of your fair city has become infected by great madness. Gethem has turned sour. Shiverig shrugged as if the news was commonplace. It has always fallen to how Shiverig to be the shield of the land, Nusselo said. His tone was patronizing. I am aware of the responsibilities bestowed to my house, Duke Shiverig said. Anger laced his voice at being reprimanded in such a way. Of course there is some unrest in the outer provinces that is to be expected during the harvest months. I fear we are being plagued by something far worse than typical unrest. Seven villages containing small monasteries devoted to the teachings of Atenos have been destroyed. The farmhouses have been put to the torch and the livestock of the villages butchered and left to rot in the smoking embers. I am sorry to hear that, old father, Shivrick said. His finger rolled on the armrest of his chair. The frontier villages are not for the meek. Those who live there know the risks. The villages were left crucified on tall posts surrounding the halls of prayer. Each post has a plaque nailed to the top of the cross with the words... False believer, written in blood. Yet in other villages, the ravens have been deprived of their feast. The villagers have simply vanished. Yet their possessions remain in place. This is not the work of commonplace bandits. You must send troops to protect the souls of the innocents. Duke Shiverick's ire grew. His opinion of Grandmaster Nusselo changed. The man was just another version of King Conrad. Only Nusula disguised his desire to take from House Shivering behind the glamour of spiritual guidance. As I have said, the wilderness is a dangerous place, and I cannot run to the rescue of every remote hamlet when a roving band of brigands comes calling. The king has taken great care to thin my already depleted armed ranks. I have no more to give. Shivering shrugged his shoulders. These people have chosen to live outside the protection of my city walls. They pay little in tax to Volcarum's keep coffers, and therefore I am less inclined to help. Perhaps you could send a gaggle of monks to each village and pray for their well-being. My Lord Duke, brigands pay no heed to the faith of others, nor care of, of the taxes paid to coffers, Grandmaster Nusselo said. These people need you. The Knights of Gethem must ride. Malachi subtly cleared his throat in disagreement with which the Grand Master raised a curious eyebrow. This is the work of the followers of Moore, a senior monk said. They are attempting to drive the faithful of Atenos from the land of Barokia. King Conrad has decreed that all faiths are welcome in the realm. You have no proof of this, monk. The followers of Moore are not butchers. This is an outrageous accusation, Malachi said. He glared at the Grand Master. You should know better. The Grand Master nodded to Malachi. This is true. Uh, my aid misspoke. Uh, currently, there is no conclusive evidence to the contrary. For now, we will assume these atrocities are what they appear to be. 
I apologize for the slight to your prophet, Ashvashi Malachi. The Grand Master's tone was respectful, yet carried the weight of a man with a heavy burden. The Grand Master returned his attention to Duke Shivery. The city of Gethim is in chaos. Have you not seen this with your own eyes? When has a scion of how Shiverick allowed such lawlessness in the streets of Gethim? Duke Shiverick straightened in his chair. His anger rose. Who was this feeble monk to dare criticize him and his family's honor? He felt Malachi's bony fingers press into his shoulder. It was enough of a gesture to remind Shiverick of the strategy behind this meeting. Yes, the unrest does appear to be a bit more pronounced of late. Perhaps some of it is caused by these unorthodox cults of the Prophet Moore. I don't know. Their ideas of constant change are not to my taste. I appreciate order. But, as your man says, all religions and faith are welcome, per the king, Duke Shiverick said. I suggest you take your grievances to the king's council in Quakal. You are honor-bound to at least investigate the evil infecting the lands under your stewardship. You must report your findings to the highest authority so that a solution can be found. Masula's demeanor remained calm, though his words were like arrows into Duke Shiverick's pride. Highest of authority, indeed. By that you mean King Conrad, Duke Shiverick said with a slight smirk. This is unlikely to happen. Conrad can gather reconnaissance with his men, or you can send one of your traveling monks to the borderlands. The monks of the four orders will wait to see how we can best assist the king's decision. Duke Shivery leaned forward. There is another solution. Help me take command of the five armies. I assure you I would end the malady afflicting the land in short order. I am sure the spiritual blessing of the Reverend Grand Master Nusolo and the backing of the Temple of Illumination would go far in the ears of the King's Council. The Grand Master closed his eyes. Duke Shiverick heard a slight sigh escape the Grand Master's lips. Duke Shiverick knew his message had been received. He waited patiently for the Grand Master's answer. The crackle and pop of the fire burning against the wall filled the room. The Grand Master finally shook his head. You know I cannot. The officials at the temple are not to influence politics or side with any noble house or cause. We are the living spirit and faith of Atenos. We are not political pawns to be used to outmaneuver rivals. Duke Shivering eased back into his chair. He wasn't surprised by Nusilo's obvious answer. Indeed, we all have our paths to walk. You see, old father, I have already mobilized a contingent of my forces to the northern borders. My men may already be shedding their blood defending the land. And just earlier, your king asked for more. But where are the other armies? There is but a token host mustering at Kokal. Where are Duke Rokix, Lord Fritters, or Lord Manda's men? The duke continued with an irritated voice. Truly, I am doing everything in my power to assist the paper crown, even at the expense of the stability of my fair Gethem, as you have so kindly pointed out. And why are my forces spread thin across Barokia, while King Conrad keeps his men safely in Kukal? Why indeed, I wonder. Why does King Conrad not deal with these brigands himself? Perhaps there is a deeper reason. Which would be? Nasula looked perplexed. Due to the lack of support and decisive action from the crown, my thoughts cannot help but stray to thinking King Conrad is under the yoke of the Mad One in the north. Impossible, said Nasula's second aide. The younger monk placed his foot on the first step of the dais. The knight at Duke Shiverick's side held his mace ready to strike. The Grand Master gave a sideways glance at his aide. The monk immediately bowed low. Forgive me, Grand Master. I apologize for my emotional outburst and lack of control. Nasula accepted his apology with a nod. The Grand Master then looked at Duke Shivering and his knight. Lower your weapons, Sir Marchand. Let us remain cordial in the presence of our esteemed guest, Duke Shivering said. He was curious about what would happen if the conversation escalated to violence. Just how fast could the old monk move? 
The Grand Master nodded his appreciation as Sir Martian begrudgingly lowered his mace. Duke Shiverick, you are considered the champion of Barokia, and as such, you must accept your role as the servant of the king. Yes, yes, Duke Shiverick said. His voice was razor sharp. All the symbolism and none of the authority. Command of the five armies should be mine and mine alone. I fear our dear king will bestow that honor to his competent son, Dane, or perhaps that imbecile Baron Rogig. Yet the knights of Gethem account for more than a third of the might of the five armies. These are my loyal men. Again, if I had the support of the temple, we could correct what is now wrong in the realm. Grandmaster Nisulu listened politely. His manner was peaceful when he spoke. Now is not the time to revisit family rivalries or hurt pride. Times have changed. Let the past stay where it belongs. You have authority in your city, yet we see the faithful of Athenus being unjustly persecuted. The public square in the temple district are full of crucifixions. How can you Turn a blind eye. All faiths and spiritual ways must be given equal measure. That is the great balance we all bow to. Thieves, witches, and the treasoners are dealt with according to the law. Faith is irrelevant, Duke Shiverick said. I will not tolerate disloyalty or betrayal. This is well known. Shiverick's eyes challenged Nusula, but Nusula would not rise to the bait. The Grand Master remained calm and composed. Malachi boldly stepped in front of the duke, but his voice was that of a hissing snake. The time of Aetanos the Bright has passed into darkness. He's known as Aetanos the Abandoner in many corners of the realm. When the people have fully embraced the change of Moor, they will want for naught and will be delivered from this depravity. There shall be a great cleansing, and the faithful will be rewarded. The Grand Master's countenance softened as he looked at Malachi. His words were coated with pity. You seek to control the people through deception and distraction. You court the weak-minded and take advantage of their fears. To do so upsets the great balance and darkens the light of those you touch. I fear your prophet more is but a pawn to the great manipulator. Malachi sneered. Such are the words of the self-righteous. He turned to Duke Shiverick. You see, my lord, it is worse than you expected. Not only has Aether has abandoned the people, my servants that remain have mouths filled with lies. Duke Shiverick worried at the sudden level of passion emanating from his arch -vashim. Malachi's voice held too much excitement. This wasn't the approach he had expected or wanted from his adviser. Rather than building a bridge of common ground with the Grand Master and the Temple of Illumination, Malachi was pushing the monks away. At this rate, they would never unify under his banner. Duke Shivering motioned to the page at the far entrance of the Great Hall. Who's next? Thankfully, the Grand Master understood at once that his time was over. He bowed low. Apologize for being abrupt, old father, but there are many that would have the ear of their Duke this day. Let me think more about what you have said. We shall speak again. Thank you for the time you have given us, Duke Shiverick. Follow and be guided by the light. Another page came to ferry the monks away from the days. Duke Shiverick barely acknowledged the good wishes of the Grand Master. Malachi, you damn fool! I should have you flogged for such an outburst or ripped that viper's tongue out of your throat! He was tempted to cancel the remaining audiences. His mind raced with appropriate punishments for his arc -vashim. Malachi had some explaining to do. I question your tact, Shiverick said. He pointed a gnarled finger at Malachi as the arch -vashim entered the library. You did more damage than good. Malachi poured himself a goblet of wine and sat at the large oak table at the center of the room. The walls were lined with old tomes bound in leather. Iron candelabra stood upright, holding candles of various lengths. Their flames danced upon oiled wicks. The hot wax dripped from the candelabra's iron arms, creating miniature stalactites. If I had played to the sensibilities of the old man, he would have immediately seen through that act. I told you, he will not sway from tradition. And to borrow a simple idea of those fervent monks, 
When faced against an immovable object, one must flow like water around it. Simply put, there are other avenues to explore to reach your goal. Your path to the throne requires a broader view of our world and the other realms connected to it. Don't bore me with your stories of divine intervention. Influence be damned. Steel is the real power that creates empires and brings lesser men to their knees, Shivering said. With all due respect, my lord, Grandmaster Nuzzle is no lesser man. You will need something special to move him, Malachi said. His words slithered out of his mouth, tempting the duke to hear more. I'm listening. There are alliances to be made that will unite the three kingdoms under one roof. I have recently made contact with one who will be a great asset to you. She is the lever that will move Nusula one way or the other. More politics, Shivering said. He yearned for the truth of battle, not more of Malachi's schemes. He understood what a properly placed sword could do to bone, blood, and muscle. Politics were for weak men that tricked and schemed behind other people's backs. He took the dagger from his belt and thrust it into the table. I grow tired of waiting. Malachi took a long draught of wine from his goblet. Soon everything will change. Of course there will be a price to pay, but when is there not for greatness? Malachi, you sound as if you wish me to make a deal with the devil. A mischievous smile crept up the corners of Malachi's mouth. Interesting choice of words. Four. Sekka. Sekka brooded as she walked along the ice passageway that led to her bath chamber. She had received word from her spies. The red devil was on the move again. This Fander had invaded the territory of one of her weaker allies, a devil based in the outer plains that provided her with early warnings of the movements of her enemies, of which there were many. In her many years, she had never known a more tenacious devil than this Fander. Well, except for herself, of course. Soon she would be called upon to send more troops from her Frost Legion to support her allies' war effort. The plea for help was nothing new. But it was best to be cautious rather than rash. Lord Uziax, first general of her army, was sent to survey the actual damage. It was wise to keep a watchful eye on her allies and their so-called needs. The outskirts of Gathos was a spawning ground for ambitious demons and the occasional lesser devil. Everything in the abyss desired more power. It was a greedy addiction that was never satiated. Therefore, whenever she discovered one of her minions had become too influential, she would send Lord Uziax to ensure the new demon lord knew his place. Typically, a tithe would be levied and a new warlord would rise in the ranks of a Frost Legion. And on rare occasions, Uziax brought back the demon lord's head. There were those in the abyss that simply did not understand their place. She reflected on the numerous carcasses of demons and devils, collected over centuries and frozen in place within the walls of the corridor. Each of them had thought to betray her or steal what was hers. Such fools, she thought. One day that pest Vander would become a permanent installation in a macabre museum. That was a pleasant thought. She entered a changing room and removed her headdress. The skulls and bones clattered as she laid the ornamental piece down. She donned a smaller crown, made of upright canine teeth. Each tooth was ripped from the mouth of an insubordinate demon as punishment for failure. Seca saw herself, reflected in the smooth surface of the ice walls of the chamber. She was glorious. She enjoyed being in the form of a mortal human and appreciated the sleek, sensual curves of her body. She was fascinated by the graceful way her arms and legs flowed as she walked. She saved her demonic body for bloodier work. Even after all the centuries of her existence, she still relished the expression of horror her captive wore as she changed her shape before their awestruck eyes. Her quick ascendancy had created bitter jealousy among the minions of hell, with mortal and divine enemies soon to follow. Chief among them was now the Red 
devil Sis Fander. He was the only force strong enough to challenge her reign on Garthos. I have defeated him before and will do so again, she thought. But her confidence was thin. Somehow Ziz Fander was able to move his horde of fire demons across the abyss unseen until the moment he struck. Then her allies would crumble before the overwhelming force of his war machine. I must have more soul energy, and soon, Seka said, as she removed her formal gown and donned a sheer robe. If she could open a chaos gate to the mortal realm. She would have the means to crush any that opposed her will. Sis Fander will be the first to perish, this time for good. Oh, she thought longingly, a chaos gate. It was the one thing that could potentially bypass the magic wards of the Amerinthine barrier. The immortal mother had made access to the mortal realm limited, or near impossible, since Seca's last invasion. Now... Only a small, cumbersome portal could be opened for a short period of time. But the endeavor had a high likelihood of failure, and would kill the witches and warlocks used during the spell casting. Damn the immortal mother and her rules! Sec, I imagined the sole energy she could harvest with such a diabolical portal. It would be limitless. She fantasized about the day when one of the great three would elevate her status in exchange for eternal access to the mortal realm. Which supreme devil would it be? Xerthota or Asrolorsa, she mused. She didn't think the third, Moridiliax, with his two conflicting personalities, could ever stop debating with himself long enough to grant her wish. No. It would be either Zerthota or Azrolorsa. She would stand with one of them as an equal in the high pantheon of hell. A supreme devil in her own right. Ascension was the real prize. A functioning and permanent chaos gate would ensure she would receive her greatest desire. Seca quickened her step. A sheer gown was made for the skin of mortals. Humans had such thin skin and so soft. She had left it open in the front and tied it off at her waist. It was more of an afterthought. Maybe she should wear it next time she visited her captive guest. <laughs> she chuckled at the absurdity of the joke, as if an archdevil of the ice plains of hell could seduce one so pure as the great monk. Yet the myriad temptations of the abyss eventually corrupted the souls of all men. The demigod of the seven heavens was no different. The size of her gown fluttered against her skin. The material tickled her human breasts and sent sensations of delight up her spine. She reveled in the juxtaposition of containing her immense power in such a vulnerable shell. And she loved the accessories, especially her human eyes. Gateway to the soul, they said. <laughs> if the mortals only knew the truth of it. Why, she had never thought to spend more time in such a form as lost to her. She thrilled at the variety of new sensations her body experienced since the arrival of Atenas to Gathos so many years ago. The great monk remained hard and steadfast in his resistance to her charms. Eventually that would change as she introduced the second part of her masterful plan. The humans must think he's dead by now, but of course time moves differently in the abyss, she mused. She pushed open the door to her bath chamber. The room was dimly lit by sconces emanating a bluish glow around the base of the walls. A circular tub full of slush was sunk into the middle of the floor. Two dozen humans hung from great hooks above the tub. They resembled beasts swinging in a slaughterhouse. Seca watched with a pleasant appreciation as their life fluids streamed out of their bodies to fill her bath. Their moans resonated off the cold walls and filled the chamber with an eerie melody. It was music to her ears. Seca looked up at them with contempt. Humans were blind and dumb to the hidden power they each possessed. The true essence of the soul remained a mystery to them. Yet it determined their actions, and was the spark that enabled them to think, to feel, to evolve. 
She shook her head as she thought of how badly they misused such a gift on mundane endeavors. No matter. This served as an excellent fuel for her dark machinations. This group was all that was left from Lord Oziax's last visit to her slave pits. The stockade would need to be replenished. She knew she was desperately low on reserves. Fighting the wars of others for future favors had helped her ascend quickly, but it came with a cost. She was starved continuously for more soul energy to replenish the ranks of her armies. The only way to increase her allotment of souls in the abyss was to gain more territory. But this Vander was consuming the lands of her allies faster than she could conquer or steal more. Again, she thought of the power she could wield by maintaining an active chaos gate. But even before the Amarinthian barrier, the portal was inconceivable to create. The unique components needed for its birth were not to be found in the abyss. She chuckled to herself. That foolish monk had given her the first rare component with his arrival on Gathos. It was only a matter of time before he unwittingly provided her with a second piece. Aetanos would be the doom of the mortal realm. Ah, her revenge became sweeter by the moment. Seca disrobed and descended into the dread slush with a satisfied smile. Her skin became taut at the refreshing cool wrapped around her flesh. The soothing properties of the bath relaxed her muscles as she waded deeper into the pool. The warm blood of the dying slaves showered over her head. It matted down her hair in rent clumps. A deep sigh eased from her lips as she smeared blood over her cheeks and mouth. The pain of her slaves was delicious. Her mind drifted toward the pleasurable scenarios of pain she intended to inflict on Cis Fander. She would take her time and savor the victory. She grew excited when she envisioned turning his lands of fire to ice. She had done it before, and she would do it again. Seca heard the clatter of heavy armor approaching the bath chamber. Her mood soured. General Oziax had returned early from his mission. That much was clear. But she hadn't expected his return for days. Could this not wait until I called for him? Something was very wrong. Seca could hear it in his quickened footsteps, as well as the heavy knock on the chamber door. My queen, I bring dire news. Seca scowled as she rose from her bath. Enter, Lord Oziax. The great demon lord bowed low upon entering the chamber. He wore his mortal form, as was her command while in her inner sanctum. General Oziax appeared as a tall, well-built man. He wore pure white armor, the texture of a seashell covered in barnacles, with ocean blue accents gleaming along the seams of the ancient plate. He held his helm in his hand. The fell blade ice horror was sheathed in its scabbard at his hip. You had best have a good reason for disturbing my respite. What news do you bring that requires such a dramatic entrance? Sekka said. General Osiax brushed long white strands of hair from his face and tucked them behind his mortal ears. My apologies, my queen. I thought you would want to hear my report as soon as possible. Sis Fander has taken another of the wild frostlands that border Gathos. It has been turned into molten slag. Yes, that seems to be his agenda of late. What about it? Annihilating a frontier realm, even one neighboring Gathos, seems hardly worth the effort. What does he hope to gain? There is no strategic significance in holding unformed lands that dissolve with the whims of chaos. There is no soul reward to exploit, and the inhabitants are a scattering of undisciplined war bands. Let Lord Alsdios worry about controlling his stewardship of those shapeless lands. My queen, everything is gone, buried under a cooling magma. And soon Lord Alsdios will regroup. He will spread his seed and fertilize another uncharted land as he has done for countless millennia. That is his role in the abyss. Why worry if this Fander wastes his resources in such a way? She played with the viscous strands of blood that stretched down from the bodies above her head. Sis Fander was trying to taunt her, nothing more. She wouldn't be distracted by such things. Lord Ausdios has been obliterated. 
His infernal essence has been utterly destroyed, never to be reformed. Seca's pulse quickened. No one in their right mind would destroy one of the seven Chaos Wardens. They were untouchable. Well, now, that is something. Lord Oziax now had her full attention. Sisfander does not possess such power to remove one such as Alstios from the abyss permanently. He must have a patron shadow. But who? I know not, my queen. Many have openly show the resentment of your triumphs. Oziax snarled. But I will find out. Time has quickened for us, Seka said, and then scoffed at the robe offered to her late by Lord Oziax. She was in no mood for his inability to understand mortal formalities. Have Chetty Pay send word to my minions on the mortal plane. Sestra is to go to the northern kingdoms. There she will find the sorcerer Maukas. She will know what to do. Then the assassin Dax will introduce himself to one of the monks at the Temple of Illumination in Gethim. And a prisoner? Has there been any progress? Lord Oziax said. The archdevil had already left the chamber. A trail of red footprints followed her down the corridor. The great monk will break. In the meantime, I shall lay out my plans for the invasion of the three kingdoms of Hanna. Five. Kasai. Kasai sat motionless on a square mat in the dimly lit meditation hall. His eyes were closed. He breathed slowly through his nose. He heard the distant screech of a broad-winged crest eagle. He envisioned the majestic bird soaring on thermal drafts in a cloudless sky. Then listened to the whispers of a light breeze rippling through the pine needles and oak leaves in the lower ravine, miles below the monastery buildings. He reprimanded himself for being so easily distracted. He returned to concentrating of the flow of his breathing. A wandering mind was a weak mind. That was a dangerous thing. He sat in the half-light of the room with his brothers, each monk focused on observing the sensation of air passing over their upper lip, through the nostrils, and then out again. All other aches and pains, no matter how severe or uncomfortable, were dismissed. The exercise was designed to reduce the noise within one's conscious mind and Reveal to the monk the possibilities of the subconscious world. The monks maintained the concentration for long hours each day. Master Dore spoke silently from the shadows of the race days in the front of the hall. The Order of Ordo has always followed the teachings of the Pillars of Light, set by the first monk, Jen Mahl, the founder of the Four Orders of Atenos. We join our spirit to the life force held within each being. We share in its peace and harmonize together to become one. It is a sacred gift from the boundless. Only when you have achieved complete selflessness of heart, mind, and body will you come to know the full power of the boundless. Be wary of the path of ease, for this is the path of the common man. He will walk in it as the accepted and proper way. He will believe it is the only truth that exists. He will believe and accept only what is known to be possible. His mind then enters a trap of containment and stagnation. You must erase what is possible from your mind. Only then will you see the infinite paths of not yet conceived realities. These are the paths you will walk as a master monk of Ordu. This is the boundless. Kasai heard a whisper and then soft laughter from the row behind him. His mind snapped back to the reality of the room. Painful pinpricks raced through his crossed legs. A dull ache in his lower back made itself known. How long had they been sitting here, he wondered. Brother Jeresker was at it again with his ill-timed wit. But how will the boundless get us girls? He was one of the older monks. Daku referred to him as flapping gums. Like many of the monks living at Ordu, Jarescu had been brought to the monastery by a traveling master. He was a mix between the dark-haired jungle dwellers of Sunne 
and the light-skinned horse farmers of the great grass plains of northern Barokia. He had a broad frame, yet delicate facial features and hands. His cheekbones sat high on his face and emphasized the upward slant of his almond-shaped eyes. Jeresco continued, Let me introduce you to the boundless, my dear. It will set you free of those clothes. Kasai heard more quiet laughter from behind. He worried that Master Dore might think it was him interrupting the lesson. But he needed more attention from the master monk. Luckily, Master Dore chose to ignore the slight disturbance of his pupils. The four orders were built upon this premise. It is the way of Athenos. This is your path, young initiates. Jeresco was relentless now that he had his audience. I think I will develop a different way. I'll call it the way of Jeresco. My path will combine the ancient powers of rest, relaxation, and sleep. Morris is killing me. Daku sat on the right of Kasai. Kasai could feel the tension stirring in his friend. Daku's breathing had changed from steady and calm to short, quick breaths. Concentrate, brother, Kasai whispered while keeping his own eyes closed. I can feel the heat from your fire, Zindu, from where I sit. Release your water, Zindu. Let it soothe you. Kasai heard Daku's breathing increase in tempo. Stay with Master Dore's words. That's right, Master Dore. I'll travel straight to dreamland, I will. Jeresco continued, eliciting more quiet laughter from the younger monks. Kasai cracked his eyes. Master Dore's eyes were open and looking straight at him. Kasai immediately closed his eyes. Master Dore continued with emphasis. Meditation strengthens the mind. It provides a true path for the flesh to follow. But beware, the path of ease will ensnare the undisciplined mind. You must always be mindful of distraction, for the unfocused mind is susceptible to the temptations of the deep dark. You will learn to channel the wonders of the boundless through diligent training and meditation. Harness your passion and control its direction. Otherwise, you will lose your way and become a lost soul. This is suffering. This is emptiness. Meditate on my words. Contemplate the boundless, Master Dore said. Kasai heard Master Dore shuffle out of the room. The rapid breathing of Daku continued and echoed in his ears. Calm your breathing, brother, and be at peace. Kasai whispered. I can manage without your instructions, Daku said tersely. The words came between clenched teeth. A moment later, Kasai felt the air move swiftly across his right side. Daku spoke in a low, menacing tone to the row behind him. You have upset the meditation with your distractions, Jeresco. Apparently the meaning of Master Dore's lesson is outside the realm of your understanding, Daku said. Jeresco stared back defiantly. Lighten up, Daku. You could benefit from a good laugh. A few of the monks to his right and left chuckled under their breath. That's it, thought Kasai. Jeresco is a dead man. Kasai turned his head just enough to see Daku entirely reversed on his mat, staring intently at Jeresco. Daku leaned forward, closer to Jeresco's face. And since today's lesson was lost upon you, I am willing to bring special attention to your spiritual well-being during the tournament today. The smile dropped from Jeresco's slender lips. Daku pointed his finger into Jeresco's chest, almost pushing him over. That's right, Jeresco. You see it now, don't you? Your lesson begins in the sparring circles. And at that time, brother... I will take my time explaining Master Doria's words to you. Until then, keep your mouth shut. Daku turned back around, closed his eyes. Why did you threaten him like that? Kasai whispered. He's your brother. Daku scoffed at the familiar reference. I am tenderizing the meat before the tournament. Plus, I just don't like him. You don't like anyone? Mostly? Kasai shook his head. Daku was headed down a dangerous road. He pushed the boundaries of what was needed to achieve a goal and what was overkill. 
Kasai's thoughts drifted back to Masadoria's lesson. Somewhere there was an answer. An early morning mist lingered when the monks emptied from the meditation hall into the central courtyard. Colors of their training garb resembled autumn seasonal bounty of falling leaves. The warm sun reflected off the monks' yellow shirts and bright orange leggings as they practiced the secret fighting techniques known only to the four orders of Aetanos. Twenty of the younger monks took the center of the square. They placed themselves in an equally spaced pattern before bowing to the senior monk who led them through the drill. Their lean, muscular bodies moved in unison, sometimes as a flash of lightning from heaven, while at other times stiff and static like the granite of the deepest earth. Kasai removed his outer robe. His forearms were covered in tattoos. The markings were runes of power he had received from past achievements. The symbols granted him limited abilities when he mentally engaged their stored energy. Kasai knelt over a bucket filled with gravel. A similar bucket to his right was filled with sand, then one with rice, and the last one with dried beans. Daku joined him, but took the one to the left. It was filled with iron shot. If they had a final bucket of sharp glass, you would take it if I took the iron first, Kasai said to his friend. Yep. Daku cocked his arm back and thrust his hand into bits of iron like a spade. Feels good. Kasai rolled his eyes. Show off. He jabbed his hand into the bucket of gravel. He twisted his entire arm at the shoulder with each blow. Daku picked up the pace of his strikes. Kasai followed. It was a race to the bottom. Touched, Daku said. He pulled his hand out and held up his bloody fingertips. Kasai was only about a third of the way through the gravel in his bucket. One of these days I will beat you, Kasai said. He didn't care who won, but he knew Daku did. No, Kasai, you won't. The three masters of Ordo came into the square to observe the progress of the initiates. They were dressed in long, multi-layered robes of sky blue with indigo pants and white sashes. Master Dore's face was round and smooth as a polished stone. He stood in between Master Shoker and Master Kunshin. He was built like a glacier boulder with short legs and a barrel-shaped chest. Master Dore was a foot shorter than Master Shoker and half that again of Master Kunshin. He wore a wide-brimmed old rice hat made of straw, which ended in a point. He nodded in agreement, as Master Kunshin pointed out a young monk performing a particularly challenging punch-kick-punch combination. Master Kunshin wore a similar wide-brimmed hat. The thin leather straps holding it in place disappeared beneath his long, wispy beard. His keen eyes carried the heritage of Sunne, raced upward at the corners, but were an uncanny blue. His flowing hair was aged to a soft gray. Master Shogar stepped forward to address the monks. He stroked his long mustache and beard in contemplation while the sun warmed his smooth, hatless head. Master Shogar's hair always reminded Kasai of unblemished snow. Master Shogar clapped his hands once. The monks stopped their training and jogged to form a circle around the masters. They bowed and waited patiently for instruction. Master Shogar stroked his long beard again. You shall now be paired with your opposite. Choose one to attack and one to protect. You shall learn your weakness by observing the strength of your partner. The winner will lead the rest on a mission outside the monastery walls. Let the tournament begin. Kasai felt a firm hand on his shoulder from behind. He didn't need to turn around to know who it was. Let's go, Kasai. It's you and me. Daku's body was built for strength and power. He fought like an enraged bull. Daku always took an aggressive approach when sparring. Strike first and hard. And before your opponent can respond, charge forward and strike again. Kasai was smaller than most of the brothers his age, especially Daku. He was a smart fighter who took a defensive approach against his opponents. Kasai was patient. When the moment was right, he unleashed quick and accurate counter-strikes. The two friends made a formidable fighting team. Daku surveyed the other monks with contempt. We both know how this will play out. I'll take the role of striker, you protect my weak side. We are assured of victory. Not this time, brother. I'm faster, Kasai said as the two friends received matching red arm sashes from a young initiate. Your opinion is noted and dismissed as irrelevant. I mean to win. You go too easy. Daku searched the other monks being paired with their partners. 
Where's Jureska? Ah, there he is over there. Kasai saw Jureska being matched with Brother Shiro. This will be easier than I thought. I won't even need you to defeat them both. Taku, why must you make enemies of your brothers? It won't always be me protecting your back. One day you will need to rely on one of them, perhaps with your life. Doubtful. But I'm glad you have accepted your role without much fuss today. Let's go. We're being called to the first circle. Individually, Kasai and Daku were formidable opponents. When they were paired together, they had no rivals. Much of their friendship was based on outdoing the other's most recent accomplishments. The competition began. The monks fought in pairs as Master Shurier dictated. The winners advanced while the defeated moved to the side. Eventually, two pairs remained. Jeresko and Shiro stepped into the center circle. An unfortunate fate for the two monks. I'm impressed you dare to remain in the competition this long, Jeresko. I had thought you would intentionally remove yourself early, rather than face me in the later rounds, Daku said. He prowled around Jeresko and Shiro like a hungry predator. I wonder, did you tell Shiro of the punishment that awaited you? Did he know I would have to go through him to get to you? So much talk, talk, talk. I think he's scared, Jeresko, Shiro said. He had a slight Sunese accent, which accentuated the vowels of each word. Shiro had mixed blood and was the offspring of foothill nomads who traveled between Sunni and Barokia. Daku glared at Shiro. Poor, poor Shiro. Shiro accepted a blue arm sash and tied a second to Jeresko's bicep. Shiro was a scrappy and wiry fighter with long limbs and wore his hair in a top knot like Kasai. Today it was pulled and wound in a ball on the back of his head. You were lucky to be paired with Kasai. Without him, you would be lost. He is the only reason you have made it this far, Jeresko said. He stretched out his limbs, then unleashed a furious punching combination into the air. Jeresko continued to bait Daku as the other monks gathered around the center circle. And Daku, as you can see by our brother's smiles, they know it too. Kasai was impressed with Jeresko's confidence, though it was misplaced. Kasai knew Daku was growing angrier with each insult. He would not hold back. The four monks entered the center circle. They formally bowed to each other, then to the masters. Some of the monks began to cheer on their favorites. Kasai stretched and rolled through different martial forms. Daku just stared at Jeresko. Stay with the strategy. It has worked well today, Kasai said. Jeresko will eventually strike with a mountain wind kick. He always does, Kasai said. He shook out his arms and legs. This leaves him vulnerable, and Shiro is usually out of position for a proper defense. If you are patient, we will have them with ease. Kasai looked at his friend with worried eyes. He knew Daku's judgment faltered when his anger took over. His fire zindu would rise to uncontrollable levels, and he would lose himself to blind rage. All the monks had a difficult life before coming to the monastery. Daku had it worse than most. Don't let his words distract you. Stay with the strategy, Kasai said. He moved in front of Daku and once more became a whirlwind of defensive postures. Each movement overlapped the last to prevent an opponent from gaining a positional advantage. He was ready. Daku needed only to wait. It was the key to their success as a team. Eventually, their opponents would make a mistake. Then the two friends would pounce in tandem like waves up on the sand. Change your plans, Kasai. This one has a painful lesson to learn, Daku said. He jumped ahead of Kasai and unleashed a brutal kick with a shimmering red glow trail behind his spinning leg. His foot whipped around and connected with Shiro's midsection. The move was completely unexpected. Shiro crumbled to the dirt of the circle, gasping for air. In the next instant, Daku was driving Jeresko back to the edge of the ring. You dare use Zindu energy on a brother? Jeresko cried out. He shuffled backward in a mixture of confusion and fear. What kind of monster are you? The kind who wins, Daku said. He shoved Jeresko back a step, then twisted around and hit him with a kick to the chest. A strike to a nerve cluster in Jeresko's right arm left it dead below the elbow. Jeresko looked expectantly at Kasai. Do something! Kasai stood as dumbfounded as the rest of his brothers. Jeresko was a skilled fighter, but he was outmatched. Daku was relentless. Even if Jeresko had a second defensive partner, the outcome would have been the same. 
Jaresko took a vicious kick to the side of his face and dropped to one knee. His mouth was red from blood. Enough! I yield! Daku chopped down to the left side of Jaresko's neck. The beaten monk dropped to the ground with a thud. The fight was over for Jaresko, but not for Daku. He knelt beside Jaresko and grabbed him by the shirt. Daku lifted Jaresko enough so he could speak clearly into his ear. Remember this moment, Jeresko. It will help strengthen your mind and keep it aligned during meditation. I expect your full attention during Master Dory's next lesson. Daku curled his fist into a tight ball. He smiled as he punched Jeresko in the face. Jeresko's nose shattered. Daku released Jeresko's shirt, dropping him unceremoniously to the ground. The central square was deadly quiet. Kasai was stunned. Daku stood up. Darkness fell across his face when he stepped over Jaresko. Easy. Shiro found his strength and crawled over to his fallen partner. He raised his fists in a valiant defense. Two monks ran into the circle to collect Jaresko before Daku could do more harm. They lifted his body off the ground and carried him in the direction of the infirmary. Shiro followed behind. His eyes never left Daku. The monks surrounding the circle began talking and shouting at once. Master Shogar clapped his hands together and order was restored. The wall of monks reformed around the sparring circle. Kasai wondered why the masters had not stepped in and disqualified them. Was this another lesson? Brother Daku, please return to the circle. You and Brother Kasai have earned the right to continue. In this contest, you shall face your ally and your weakness. Thus, you shall expose your truth and find inner balance, Master Shoujo said. Kasai looked squarely at Daku. Was that necessary? Jareska could have easily been removed, and Shiro was no threat. You and I both knew their blind spots. Daku took the blue arm sash handed to him. You were there, Kasai. You heard him. He needed to be taught a lesson. But not by you. That is for the masters to decide. There are rules. Your rules, not mine. What? Leaders blaze new trails for others to follow. That's always been your problem, Kasai. You refuse to take the first step. Therefore, you will always be a follower. Not me. I intend to win now, too. That is why I will be commanding the brothers tomorrow, and not you, my friend. The two were a dynamic pair when fighting as a unit. Daku excelled at throwing lethal offensive strikes, while Kasai masterfully countered every attack from their opponents. But now it was a contest of opposing styles. Kasai moved with exceptional agility. His fighting style was based on making his opponent miss, rather than seeking to strike a critical blow. Daku had less finesse. He used aggression and strength to overwhelm his opponents. Begin, Master Shoujo said. Daku was on him before Kasai finished his bow. Daku spun, using the same strike that left Shiro doubled over in pain. His attack was aggressive and quick. Kasai snapped his body backward. Really? Daku was caught off guard and spun full circle. His leg hung overextended in the air just long enough for Kasai to step forward and grab it. For the briefest moment, Kasai had Daku at his mercy. The match could have been decided then with one blow, but Kasai released Daku without delivering a successful strike. Sounds of disappointment rose from the crowd. See, you are not able to do what is necessary to win, Daku said. He regained his balance. Brother, these bouts mean nothing to me. Everyone knows you strike first. It leaves your defense vulnerable. Always the honorable one and forever second. Trust me, the real world doesn't follow your rules. Daku lunged at him. Kasai moved to the side with fluid grace. He found the perfect defensive posture to deflect Daku's attack, then diverted the power of the strike away from his body. Daku growled with frustration. Kasai sent a barrage of harmless, yet distracting jabs to Daku's face. Daku swatted them all away, grabbed Kasai by the shirt, and knee-kicked Kasai in the chest. That one hurt. So, the little mouse can be hit after all, Daku said. He gloated as if he had already won. Kasai threw a jab that got through Daku's defense. He snapped his fist when he hit Daku's nose. It wasn't a powerful blow, but it stung. Daku cursed and staggered backward. He fell to one knee with his eyes covered. Kasai lowered his guard. He worried that he had broken his friend's nose. He had not meant to harm Daku, just push him back. Daku? 
The coup narrowed his watering eyes, then swept Kasai's leg with a locking kick. Kasai lost his footing and fell to the ground. The coup delivered a critical blow to Kasai's face that snapped his head to the dirt. That's it! I win! The coup exclaimed. I see a bit of trickery's fair game now, Kasai said. He raised himself to his knees. He shook the dizziness from his head. The coup was already up and brushing the dirt dust from his pants. I told you. The world is an unfair place. You are not ready for it. The three masters gathered together in the center circle. Brother Daku, you have demonstrated your ability to triumph over your weakness, Master Dorhe said. Tomorrow you shall lead your brothers outside the monastery walls. Thank you, Master Dorhe. I am grateful to pass this honorable challenge. I will lead the expedition with honor, Daku said. He bowed excitedly in front of Master Dorhe. His brothers did not share his enthusiasm. Brother Kasai, to my side, Master Shoyur said. The elder monk was already walking in the opposite direction. Yes, Master Shoyur? Son, I may not have the use of these eyes, but I am not blind. Nor is the true sight robbed for Master Dorio, Master Kunshin. Might you tell me what stayed your hand during the last fight? It is important for Daku to be chosen to lead. I don't care as much. This is certain. But is Brother Daku to be the leader because he is most worthy of leading or most needy? Master, I am not a leader. Daku is right. I am not ready for such responsibility. I will only let down those who follow me. Those are Brother Daku's words. Why are you content to be the shadow of his mountain? I sense a deeper conflict, young one. We will discuss it later. Now bring me to lunch. I was told we would each have a bite of honey cake today. I mean to get mine, before Master Dohi tries to convince me there wasn't enough for everyone again. Six. Shiverick. The city of Quakal, also known as the City of Spires, served as the capital city of the Kingdom of Parochia. The throne was moved from Gethem twenty-six years past, when House Conrad claimed control of the kingdom from House Shiverick. The king's castle was an architectural masterpiece, composed of a thick bundle of towers and tall spires, inspired by the mighty pines that rose in the forests of central Barokia. The spires were made from multicolored granite, quarried from the low hills of the Sarabi Mountains in the southwest and the Hoarfrost Mountains in the northeast. King Mortimer Conrad resided in the tallest and grandest spire. Long poles sprouted from the sides of the lower towers that circle the central spire. Hanging from each was a pennant depicting a pouncing white griffin against a sky of blue. The great houses of Barokia gathered each year in King's Hall to hear their rulers decree on policy and to voice their grievances. Most of the nobles used the time to solidify side pacts with other houses, in hopes of weakening the political position of their rivals. King's Hall was an immense room, which could comfortably seat a thousand persons, with more standing room to the sides. Twelve ivory columns lined the sides of the opposing walls, which supported a cathedral ceiling inlaid with a mosaic of blue and white patterns. The ceiling resembled a heavenly sky above the tall spires of Quokal. Long and delicate torches hung from each column and cast a warm yellow light through the room. The flickering light from the torches lightly lapped against white marble icons and carved images of the immortal mother and her sires. The divine figures looked down upon the limestone floor of the extravagant hall, judging all who crossed beneath them. At the far end of the hall sat the marble throne. A chestnut rug ran down from its base, then split at the floor to encircle the entire hall. Blue banners adorned with proud white griffins hung gently from the walls. Beneath each banner hung an illuminated painting, illustrating an heroic deed of King Mortimer Conrad and his father before him. All lies, thought Duke Shiverick, as he and his retainers bullied their way into the hall. Thick stained-glass windows depicting angelic victories over the denizens of darkness were bracketed by curtains colored the same blue as the banners. The curtains had been adorned with impressive needlework of pouncing griffins lined with jewels. It was false evidence of House Conrad's delusional claim to power. 
The history of Barokia was being rewritten while the science of the real heroes still lived. A magnificent throne made from a solid block of creamy white marble sat at the end of the hall. The sides were covered in decorative etchings. Two large statues of knights in full plate stood sentry behind the king. The head of a screeching griffin was fixed at the end of each armrest. The heads were made from a single flawless stone of blue and purple tanzanite. The crown was too big on King Conrad's head. It sloped forward so that its weight wrinkled his brow. Its elaborate robes draped loosely over feminine, narrow shoulders and covered his weak knees in diminutive boots. He looked like a tiny man in an oversized dress. His displeasure at being made to wait was written across his face. The lesser man wait, thought Shiverick. He sits on a borrowed throne. Below the throne was the king's table. Four similar but far less ornate seats sat on a lower tier. Three of those seats were now occupied by the ruling members of a great house. Baron Rokig sat in the first seat to the right of the throne. He had a lean, sickly-looking face, high eyebrows with a bulbous nose above narrow lips. His hair was a mousy brown and slick as if coated with the leftover grease from cooked bacon. Shiverig never understood how a man of his nature had risen so high in the king's esteem. But then again, conniving men had a taste for one another. Rogic had a troublesome feel about him. The man was a plague in his pompous, knightly half-armor and airs of importance. None of his influence had been earned in battle as was proper. He was a leech of other men's greatness and a whisperer of falsehoods. Shivery despised the man. To Rogic's left sat Duke Manda. He claimed the self-appointed title of High Merchant of the Realm. His family's wealth was second only to House Conrad's. Manda was a tall man with a penchant for the stylish trends of the day, no matter how obscure. Shivering took him for a flashy peacock, whose only useful trait was his ability to fund war campaigns. Duke Manda had a pretty face, well-formed nose, and angular lips. He covered it all in a delicate powder with pastel eyeshadow and rose-colored blush. His clothing was no less sensational than his face. Brightly colored silks of green, yellow, and light blue draped over his lean frame. Both of his earlobes were pierced. Precious gemstones hung in loops from his ears. Shivrick's eye rose just looking at the man. Across the landing sat Lord Fritta. He was an older man with dark set eyes and a quiet demeanor. Fritta was an observer who held his tongue until he could make an informed opinion. Shivrick liked that quality in a man. Fritta wore an unadorned doublet and traditional breeches with high leather riding boots. A long scar rode across the side of his square face and dropped beneath his jawline. Fritta's attention always remained sharp and focused. Lord Fritta's ancestors had a privileged history of fighting side by side with House Shivering during the founding of the kingdom. Shivering would not call the man friend, but he did have his respect, which was worth more in Shivering's eyes than some foolish notion of friendship. Respect and the brotherhood of combat were the bridges that connected Shivering to other men. He knew what pushed a man's resolve and loyalty to the limit. Shivering valued a man's metal under pressure when blades were wet and the screams of agony pierced the air. Shivering eyed each of the men as he took his seat. Lord Fritta gave a brisk nod to Shiverick. Duke Manda was aloof to Shiverick's arrival. He was preoccupied with preening for the crowd of nobles. King Conrad sat on comfortable pillows of blue and white, adorned with emblazoned tips of darker blue. He is a soft man, thought Shiverick. He's always been soft. Rogi glared at Shiverick from his chair across the platform. His pale skin reflected a tinge of blue. You strike at the king's displeasure with your lack of punctuality, Duke Shiverick. Shiverick stood. He addressed the king with a short bow. My apologies to the king and lords present. I was busy doing nothing and forgot. Shiverick responded without much sincerity. Laughter echoed through the hall, followed by excited murmurs. Many of the nobles from the great houses came solely to hear the strained discourse between Conrad and Shiverick. They stood in a wide semicircle set back twenty paces from the throne. There was standing room only today. 
You shall not mock this court with your insolence, Duke Shiverick, King Conrad said. The crown relieves you of one thousand gold diras for your tardiness, and levies the same each year for a two-year tax period. Baron Roke had called for the seneschal. Make a note and draw documents. It's always about the money. Fine, fine. Shall we begin? Shivering waved the proceeds forward. The hall was called to order. Bring forth the first petitioner, King Conrad called out. A commoner rose from the back of the room. He raised a copper baton. He was ushered to the edge of the throne area. Shivering stood just as the petitioner was about to address the king. Stop, Shivering commanded. The petitioner froze. Shivering scanned the faces of the nobles present. It is well known that House Conrad holds title on much of the lands outside Quokal. Paper barons with familial and political ties have been installed to govern these lands. In so doing, King Conrad manipulates political opinion. Bit by bit, the great houses lose their voice to the underlying Conrad dictatorship. Shivrick's face reddened as his voice rose. Weak decisions, nay! Dangerous decisions are made without proper consideration or vote from the greater and lower houses. His predatory edicts become the law of the land. He watched the reaction of the nobles and saw familiar heads nodding in agreement, while others continued with private conversation, paying him and his message no mind. There were too many of the latter. Shivrig was an influential and highly respected military leader. His strategic victories against invading barbarians from the northern kingdom of Trosk were well known. His bravery in battle was unquestioned, but his prowess on the battlefield did not carry over into the superficial politics of court. Here, men changed their allegiance without thought or conscience in exchange for lands, titles, and future favors. They forsook historic allegiances to the great houses that tamed the land. Traitors to bonds of loyalty infuriated him. Their honor was worthless. Shivery continued. Lesser men gain influence based on favorable political opinion or due to duplicitous and underhanded betrayals of solemn pledges that have endured for generations. Most of you have bought your way into lordships. The floor erupted with shouts of denial for many of the nobles. Some shook angry fists at Shivery. I have their attention now. It is no longer the greatest champion who rules through conquest, but rather the one who controls the great houses through political blackmail. And woe to the lesser houses that see their well-intentioned coalitions thrown away with a whim of the day. Perhaps this is nothing new to the uncivilized world outside of the kingdom of Barokia, and perhaps it will become commonplace here as well. Duke Shivering paused, to better let the point fester in the minds of the nobles. If his great house could be stripped of power, it could just as easily happen to theirs. We have created a weakness of rule with the safety of the realm at stake. Our decision-makers are compromised to those who hold ill favors over their heads. Shivered looked to those who had taken oaths of allegiance to his family. Their nods of agreement stoked his aggressive nature. House Shiverick was hamstrung not so long ago from regaining succession over the new administration. I call to the lesser houses to band together with me now. Our collective influence will rid House Conrad's stranglehold on the realm. Shivig stood with his legs apart and hands curl into fists at his hips. Duke Shivig, we have respectfully entertained this argument of yours on numerous occasions in the past. Must you continue to bore us with this same diatribe repeatedly? The law is set for the betterment of the realm. If you have nothing of value to present to this council, please let another take the floor. If you wish to persist, I will think your words bear the mark of treason, and you will be dealt with accordingly, King Conrad said. The condescending way the king spoke infuriated Shiverick. Was this all just a game to the man? Shiverick's temper flared. I will not be silenced. I am the head of a great house of Barokia and a member of the king's table. I have the right to speak my mind. He turned to the king. Or are you afraid the illusion of your rule will vanish? The floor erupted into arguments for and against the king. Shiverick waved his arm to settle the crowd. It is imperative that the nobles listen to reason. I have confirmed reports 
that a vast horde of barbarian raiders have amassed at the northern side of Stormwind Pass. It is time to mount a preemptive strike against the north. Hear my words, fellow nobles, and be concerned. An invasion from the Sorcerer Malgris is inevitable. Shiver noted many of the wealthy land barons with vast farming estates shook their heads in dismay. Their harvests would immediately be appropriated if a war was declared. Their annual profits would disappear. Shivrig watched them closely. It would only take the slightest shake of their heads. And King Conrad would decree that war was not the answer. What you suggest will create an immediate declaration of war from the north. I will not move forward based on information gathered from frightened peasants, King Conrad said. He shrugged his shoulders. These are rumors at best, and not immediate concerns. These reports are from my borderland rangers. The markers of a full-scale invasion are clear. Anyone with a iota of military experience would recognize the immediate danger to our kingdom. I have detailed accounts of massive movements of war machines and the strategic positioning of troops along the southern side of the Hoarfrost Mountains. Shiverick turned to the nobles. You see... The decisions of a coward forsake the safety of Barokia. We need leadership capable of protecting the realm. Now is the time to cripple the advance of the North, not with words and diplomacy, but with the strength of arms. We must root out Malgris and his mountain stronghold. House Conrad does not have the resolve to do what is necessary to protect the realm. I move for a vote of new rule. The hall erupted in an upheaval of outrage and cheers. Lesser nobles attached to House Conrad fear the change would jeopardize their positions. Those aligned with House Shiverick considered how they might profit from a new regime. Shiverick remained standing as chaos ensued below him. The guards did not come to remove him for his outburst, and he was not surprised. Conrad was a coward and did not have Shiverick blood running through his veins, for if any man spoke in such a way in Volcarum Keep, they would be cut down without hesitation. Sir, you have been given leniency due to the historical debt owed to House Shiverick. However, if you disrespect the crown again, I will have you barred from the king's hall. You will be stripped of all lands and titles. Duke or not, you shall respect my authority. Am I clear? King Conrad shouted over the din of the hall. He was such a weak and feeble man. The malicious smile of a viper before it struck played over Shiverick's face. Please excuse me, Highness. He let the bitterness fade from his voice. I am impassioned by the safety of our realm. I look at current events through a different lens. I see dark times ahead. Shivering half turned so the rest of the hall could hear. I have expressed numerous times my willingness to take command of the five armies of Barokia. I will bring the fight to the sorcerer before he has time to marshal his barbarian forces. The king shook his head. He appeared weary and sat back in his cushioned throne. Command of the five armies is not your concern, Duke Shiverig. Contrary to your personal belief, I am well equipped to handle our military engagements. Our strategy is a defensive one, which revolves around open communication and negotiations. We need accurate reports from credible sources. Ill-educated border folk posing as rangers of the forest will not do. These people see ghosts behind every tree and within the shadowed walls of their mud huts. If you have reconnaissance reports to share, I suggest you hand them over immediately. And I will remind you that if needed, you will add the Knights of Gethim to the hosts of the King's army here in Quakal. You will advise when and if called upon, but ultimate leadership will fall to others. Shiverick played his last card. Mortimer Conrad, you have the military prowess of a peasant child playing in the mud. I will not take orders from a lesser commander especially one who hails from the bloodline of a traitorous house. You may hold sway over the realm for now, but I will not be pushed aside like a stray dog. The hall erupted into madness. The political allies loyal to the king jumped to his defense. A call for war sounded from those side of the house shivering. A noble was shoved to the floor. Small scuffles broke out in the middle of the hall. The royal bodyguards moved into position around the king. Their weapons were drawn and pointed at shivering. His eyes narrowed, as if daring the guards to move first. As expected, they did nothing. Instead, they shuffled the king around the throne into safety. Shivering stomped down the short steps from the landing of the king's table to the hall floor. 
he and his contingent of followers shoved their way out of King's Hall. Duke Shivering left Quakal pleased with the outcome of the day's events. He was sure there would be no disciplinary action from the crown. War was pending, and the king knew it. Although Conrad was a weak man, he was politically savvy enough to understand he still needed House Shivering and its knights when war was declared. The nobles of the great houses trusted House Shivering to save them in times of need. At least that much had not changed. Now the true hearts of the nobles are known, Shivering said. His outbursts and harsh remarks of the king had revealed the allegiances of those nobles who had not publicly sided with one great house or the other. They would return to the embrace of Shivering rule once war engulfs the land, he thought. Volkerum Keep was a cold, stoic place. Shivering liked it that way. He had no time for fancy balls or grand dinner parties to entertain his fellow nobles. Let Conrad waste valuable time and money on such worthless endeavors. Shivering stared into the fire, warming the room. Today was a decision-making day. His two mastiffs lay at his feet before the fire. They growled low when the Archvashim entered the room. Malachi's usually devious expression paled at the sight of the dogs. He was wary of the beasts. Your methods begin to foster results, my duke. The unrest is growing at a steady rate. The death of the port deputy at Parn and the disappearance of another shipping baron can only be good for us, Malachi said with a soft voice. He kept a fair distance from the dogs. Once the northern raiders attack... The economic stability of Barokia will collapse. The nobles will realize the threat from the north is real, and the king will be forced to declare war. And wars have always been good for House Shivering, Malachi said. There will be no raids if I pivot from this course. Getham endures most of the unrest you are so fond of escalating. Conrad will use this to his advantage. He will declare me incompetent and unable to govern Getham effectively. He will say such a liege lord could never succeed him to rule the whole kingdom or be entrusted with its military. Shivering paced across the floor. His mastiffs followed at his heels. Malachi, I am taking a big risk. Your plan had better work. Malachi sat in a hard-backed chair close to the fire and steepled his fingers. Profit is what controls the actions of the nobles in Quakal, and a secure king equates to secure profits. The coffers of great and lesser houses alike have swollen due to King Conrad's favors and appointments. Therefore, the nobles will continue to invest their support with a current holder of the crown. But trust me, the moment their coin is threatened, their opinions will change. We find ourselves at a time when allegiances shift according to the winds of opportunity. It is your clever allegiances that trouble me most. Are you sure I can trust Malgris to fulfill his part? I believe he will. He has much to gain with this coup. He will see it through to the end. His delegates await you in the reception room. They are comfortable with food and wine. Duke Shivering paused at the door leading to the reception room. How could this be the only viable option to reclaim the throne? How had his great house lost so much strength in so few years? It was inconceivable, and now he was courting with a madman as a last resort. But now was the time to alter his course if he was having second thoughts of his actions. He could just walk away and have his men dispose of Maugris' delegates. He looked to the coat of arms above the door and the snarling dog against crossed swords. A shivering name represented power and might across the three kingdoms. If I do nothing... King Conrad will bleed how shivering dry of wealth, power, and influence. The legacy of my house will end with me, he said. He had laid out his pieces like a chess master, and Conrad had taken each one he offered. The fool thought he was gaining the upper hand. Soon the end game would begin, and the trap would close. The king had been warned. What happened next was his own doing. Shivering's hands were clean. No... I will not back down now. Malgris need only fulfill his role, and House Shivering will rise to prominence again. Shivering opened the door to greet his guests. He immediately scanned the room for threats. The northerners congregated in the far corner of the room in silence. 
A table had been set out with food and refreshments for his guests. Bowls of assorted fruits were placed between platters of glazed ham and honeyed carrots, though the food remained untouched and the wine goblets unfilled. A man walked toward Shiverick. He shimmered in the light. Shiverick assumed the optical effect was because of the man's obscure clothing. It appeared to be made from something he couldn't identify. An exotic skin, reptilian perhaps, or was it the man himself that was shifting? The dubious opinion Shivrig had of the alliance Malachi had crafted worsened. He spied three oddly shaped men huddled together in the far shadows of the room. There were two larger men, still wearing their traveling furs, standing at their side. Shivrig opened his arms wide. Gentlemen, Gethem welcomes you. Volcarum Keep is at your service. I am Duke Garen Shivrig. The three figures rose as one into a twisted heap of gangly flesh. Shivrig was repulsed at the sight of the wretches, but stood fast. It would be unfitting to cringe. Somehow he had been placed in a position of service to these frail men with bony arms and gooey smiles. War made for strange bedfellows. The three who were one came to him in a morbid embrace of interlocking elbows and shuffling feet. They stooped forward and addressed the Duke in unison. Shiverig shook the hand that was offered to him. The slick surface of the palm felt like wet, rotting leaves. Shiverig watched as sick drool slipped freely from their oversized mouths as they forced smiles to their puffy faces. Their breath reeked of old eggs. The gorge rose in his throat, and he forced it back down. His instinct was to kill this abomination, but he reminded himself that the needs of the people outweighed his own. The kingdom would be strong once more. He would set things right. Their heads were shaved to the crest. A tattoo of red ink was painted across their eyes. It rose to the edge of their high hairline and then wrapped down around their ears. Shivering thought it resembled a mask. How appropriate, he thought. Thieves at my door with smiling faces and hidden daggers. He tracked the two men who approached as shadows behind the three wretches. They moved faster than the steps they took. They were physically wrong, as if their bodies had been stuffed into human skin a size too small. The skin was stretched thin across their faces and heads. They stopped to either side of the three. These must be the enforcers intended to intimidate me. Curious. Lord Maugris is well, I hope, Shiverick said to his guests. We are the three. We are here to ensure the will of Maugris the Infinite is carried out to his exact specifications. The timetables must be adhered to and under no circumstances altered. The three spoke at the same time. The sound of their voices blended into preternatural whine. I see. Straight to the point. Well then, if I deliver my part of the alliance, what guarantee do I have that Maugris will keep his promise? Shiverick said. My men are equipped and ready to move as soon as I... See that they are, Duke Shiverick. Failure to do so will be punishable by death. The three gloated in one sick smirk. Maugris the Infinite has no use for petty titles over these rural lands. Soon he shall command not only the three kingdoms of Hanna, but also the world beyond. His promise to you will stand. Shiverig looked squarely at the three odd men. They were lying. Maugris needed him. Otherwise these three cripples would not be here claiming a victory that was, at best, a distant dream. He watched the drool fall on the floor. His desire to inflict pain upon them rose. Possibly they had a layer of magical protection. Perhaps not. Maugris was that arrogant. To think the threat of his retaliation would be enough to stay Shiverick's hand. The enforcers were another matter. They moved to positions behind him. Two clicks alerted Shiverick that the bodyguards had unsheathed hidden blades. Shiverick's body relaxed into a defensive posture. He would strike fast if they continued. The shambling mound of human flesh in front of him would die first. Gentlemen, please. We are one in this endeavor. There is no cause for threats, the shimmering man said. He moved fluidly between Shiverick and the three. 
Duke Shivering. Let me introduce myself. I am Dax, emissary of the North and master of secrets to Mistress Seca. Shivering took stock of the man. Assassin, then. Dax nodded and gave a dramatic bow. Shivering looked upon his co-conspirators and smiled. What did he expect? A tea party with lads and ladies from the court? He opened his arms wide and bellowed out a hearty laugh. <laughs> it is a strange time indeed. Come, my friends, let us eat and drink together while we discuss the future of the three kingdoms. The three partially returned his sentiment. They presented queer smiles that revealed blackened teeth, but they huddled closer together and moved back to the corner shadows of the room, as if food was anathema to their tastes. Duke Shivering. Let us discuss matter in a more civilized exchange. My lord Malgris is confident you will honor your pledge of men to his cause, though today he has a small request to ask of your great and influential house, Dax said. Go on, said Shivery. He was unmoved by this false mockingbird's lip service. My lord would like the exact locations of the monasteries of Urdu, Simitu, Harmonu, and Metho. This information will be sincerely appreciated. Dax held up his hands before Shivery could speak, and well rewarded. What could Malgris want with a bunch of reclusive monks? He turned from the light years ago, Shivery said. He moved around the table of food and wine to create some space between him and the two enforcers. Aetanos has fled this world. Malgris has nothing to fear from an old wife's tale. Malgris the Infinite fears nothing. The light betrayed him, the three said from the shadows. Six eyes caught the light of the fire and blazed at Shivery. Old scores must be settled, Dax said. He shrugged. He then meandered to the table and perused the bowl of fruit. Shivery heard the lie beneath the innocent remark. The prophecy of Aetanos' return and the rise of a new ever-hero was alive and well through the frontier villages to the hamlets outside Gethim. Shivery thought the lot of it was a bunch of nonsense. However, Malgris wanted anyone who might claim to be the avatar of Aetanos dead. And those would be the monks of the Four Orders. It mattered little to Shivery. The monks were meddlesome and best left to the secret sanctuaries. Plus, he had no use for would-be saviors. Unfortunately, the Temple of Illumination owes no favors to House Shivering. If my studies serve me, only the Grand Master of the Temple knows the locations of those monasteries, Shivering said. But I will lend some resources to assist in this endeavor, if it helps build a bond of trust between us. Dax bowed deeply. My Lord Malgris gives you his thanks. All shall be as foretold. The time of change is near. Indeed, said Shivering. His tone became serious. Listen to me. I want real assurances that your lord will uphold his agreement. He looked again at the three miserable wretches huddled together. Perhaps a show of his current strength. Remove House Conrad from the throne. I do not care how. Dax ignored Shivering's obvious ruse to divulge Malgris' strength of arms or depth of infiltration into the king's court. At the appropriate time, you shall gather your armies and bring them north. There you will join under Malgris's banner. Your combined strength shall prevail over whatever strength King Conrad can muster. Combined strength? The Mad One has no standing army, or you would not be here. The barbarians he has collected number just over a thousand, and the northern tribes do not mix well. Even if he doubled or tripled that number, they will do nothing against the might of the five armies. You want the knights, archers, and foot soldiers of Gethem to be his army. The blood of my men would be shed for his revenge, and I have no desire to declare myself a rogue house. Mistress Seca comes. She will provide Malgris with a power not seen in these lands for an age. Her legions brought forth from the realm of Gathos shall bolster your armies. Together you shall destroy all that oppose you. Shivering looked at Dax in disbelief. Are you insane? The last thing I want is Seca to return to these lands. And you say she intends to bring her legions from Gathos to the mortal realm? 
The answer is no. Duke shivering. Perhaps if you looked at the bigger picture and saw how this will all be to your benefit, you would have a change of heart. You must take me for a fool. Creatures from the abyss cannot cross the Amerinthian barrier. What you claim is impossible. If it were true, there would be demons walking the lands today. You'd be surprised, Dax said with a sly smile. And nothing lasts forever. Let's say, against my better judgment, I believe you. Somehow, Sek and her legions arrive on mortal soil. King Conrad is defeated, and Maugris has his revenge. What happens next? It seems unlikely the demons will simply return to the abyss. I think they decide to stay. Why would I want that to happen? The mistress, or I should say, Maugris, needs great commanders to lead his armies. Exceptional men such as yourself, who know this land and its people. I can see no reason why you, Duke Shivering, would not become the supreme warlord of these forces when they arrive. Dax picked through the fruit and snapped a grape from its bunch and popped it into his mouth. Quite delicious. I can easily hold the kingdom of Barokia with command of the five armies. I do not need a horde of demons laying waste to the kingdom after the fighting is done. Yes, of course. I would not keep them here either. Disgusting creatures, really. He ate another grape, and its juice squirted over his lips. Afterwards, take them where you will. There are other lands outside the boundaries of the three kingdoms to conquer. Shivrig rubbed his jaw and brooded. And what does Sekka want in return for a dark gift? A price must always be paid, he said calmly. Those insides were anything but calm. Was Maugris foolish enough to summon Sekka of Gothos back into the mortal realm? Could he do it? You are a wise man, Duke Shiverick. It is true. There is always an exchange of one type of currency or another for such matters. Seca demands a small tribute of human slaves for each season. Color frontier village here or there along the border fringes. Nothing more. They will hardly be missed. Dax dismissed the amount as if it were a mere pittance. A hole of uncertainty opened in Shiverick's gut and he was free-falling through it. He could manipulate Magrist to do his bidding and, and over time, have him removed. But Seca was something completely different. He felt control slipping through his fingers. To what end? What would the villages be used for? He said, agitated and with fists clenched. Dax tossed another grape into his mouth. Frankly, I am surprised at your hesitancy. What choice do you have but to accept the helping hand of the mistress? By my account, the king will not see how Shiverick survive his rule. And more so. What do a few peasants matter once you sit the throne of Barokia? 7. Seca Seca entered Aetana's cell. She observed a prisoner with a surgeon's eye. He hung limp against the cold, unforgiving wall. You have seen better days, I'm sure, she said with a light chuckle. Time in her dungeon had the desired effect on the great monk. The chains no longer rattled from feeble attempts at escape. Urns at his feet chugged out smoke laced with a unique blend of toxins. She intended to break his spirit along with his mind. But the mind was always first. She wouldn't want the demigod's thoughts to clear and have him call his winged friends again. She was so close. He was almost ready. She broke into a wide grin as a human toes curled on the ice floor. My dear monk, your fight has been a valiant one. I'm impressed it has lasted this long. But alas, there is no escape. You will die here on Gathos. Dried blood and dark bruises covered Aetanos' body. All but a few tattered scraps of his cobalt blue robes had been torn away. His lips wobbled slowly. Seca leaned in close. You shall not win, he mumbled through swollen and parched lips. Is that so? Seca said. She carefully moved the amulet that hung from his neck to the side. She spread the first two fingers of her other hand and dragged her sharp nails down the monk's exposed chest. 
starting at the base of his neck and ending just above his navel. She slides the final stroke across the top where she began. I find your grasp of current events amusing. Aetanus flinched in pain. Seca gave him a wink. She took hold of the loose skin at the top and gave it a slight tug to make sure she had his attention. Ready? She started to pull. She tore the strip of skin from the monk's flesh. His unusual resistance to pain had evaporated years ago. His scream echoed through the dungeon halls. Why are you still here, I wonder? Sek amused. She let go of the loose skin. She tapped him on the forehead with two blooded fingernails, then pushed his head up, forcing him to look at her. Where are the faithful servants of Aetanos? You somehow managed to find your way to my doorstep. Did you forget to leave a trail of crumbs for them to follow? Seca made a playful design on the monk's chest with the blood that came from his flayed skin. Have all of the sheep in your flock lost their way? Eaten by wolves in your absence? She taunted. Where is your ever hero? Isn't his job to rescue you or some such thing? No more ever heroes. You didn't make more before you came to my home. Such a shame. Did you know that your little stunt of breaching the amaranthine barrier has provided me with a way to travel back to the mortal realm? Aetanos opened his one good eye, swollen as it was. Once there, I shall renew the harvest of precious souls you have protected for ages. Would you like to hear what really tickles me with joy? My way will be initialized by one of your chosen. Do you remember the one? His big spell gone bad and shunned by the light and forced into exile? Marcus. Aetanos' head dropped to his chest. Gibberish spewed from his mouth. The amulet was feeding on but little remained of his sanity. Yes, Marcus, isn't that just grand? <laughs> she giggled in mirth, drunk on her delightful musings. Then her eyes blazed with anticipation. The mortal realm shall be mine. But there are things we must discuss first. She whispered in his ear with the voice of an angel, soft and comforting and filled with innocence. Aten us, my love, are you there? I need you. Seca waited in silence. She watched as Aetanos, broken mind, finally recognized the sound of the voice. Illyria, Aetanos whispered. His head rolled to the side to better see from his remaining eye. Where are you? Yes, yes, my love. I'm here. I'm here to save you, Seca said. She projected her voice outside the chamber. But the door to your cell is locked. Aetidas raised his head for a moment. He looked straight ahead as if seeing an imaginary door. He struggled to speak but managed only a whisper. I am here in chains. Someone comes, my love. I will return. Aetanos shook his head slightly as if to clear it. Illyria is here, he whispered. Was not mistaken. A single tear ran down his grimy face. Save her. But how? He pulled weakly at the shackles holding him in place. The chains mocked his efforts with clangs of their permanence. Find a way he muttered softly. All depends on me. No, 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 not on me. His head sunk to his chest. No longer my time. I am done. Time. Which time is this? Always a mystery. Time. He pulled against his chains again and sighed deeply. Ever a hero. One chance. Save a world. Yes, yes, reveal to me your avatar, Seca whispered in his ear. She cast an illusion upon herself. Her hair turned golden blonde, and her eyes the blue of a cloudless sky. She called out to Aetanos in the voice of the angel Illyria. Aetanos? The sound of a turning key released the latch locking the door. Aetanos still looked straight ahead. Seca acted the part of a lithe figure dashing into the room. Oh, Aethanos, what have they done to you? Seca's illusion of Valyria burst into tears. How you have suffered. It's all my fault. He lowered his gaze at her, 
His smile was slow and sincere. Dear Illyria, have joy. We must get you down from there. Where are the keys? No keys. Seca only. Spells of power, Aetanos said. I shall steal the secret from her as I stole the keys for the door. I shall be silent and quick as a needle in the darkness. No, no, you must not flee. Flee, e e evil place. His head fell forward. She was losing him. Oh, no, not yet, my dear monk. Not when we are so close. Seca grabbed a small vial from a nearby table. The elixir was used to revive him during more intimate sessions with sharper tools. Seca forced the foul liquid between his lips. My love, if I cannot set you free, you must call your chosen. Aetinus could only slightly raise his head. He murmured through cracked lips. Chosen? By chosen? Where are they? He seemed perplexed. Can't remember where I... I put them. You must find them. Call them with your song. Seca noticed he had regained a portion of his vigor. The elixir was working. Song? No more. Cannot sing. He moved his head slowly in denial. Seca patiently kept him focused on her goal. Concentrate and remember. Names. I must have their names. Seca moved around Athenos. Her agent in the mortal realm had provided her with the identities of potential candidates. Maybe one of them will be the next ever hero. Nisulu, she said, the name curled around her tongue. A faint smile crossed Athenos' face when he recognized the name. We raced through the jungles of Sun. Yes, Nisulu. Who else, my love? Master Monks, Fifteen, Master Dore, Master Aika, those two always competing, who could hold breath the longest, such shades of purple, wonderful, so much purple. He sighed and his head lolled to his chest, playful monks, miss them, Master Aika, Love pasta, no sauce, but lots of cheese. Seca licked her lips, anticipating a savory feast. These were the foremost followers of the demigod. Undoubtedly, one of them could be transformed into the next ever hero. How will you choose? Will it be one of the fifteen masters, Grand Master Nusulu? Seca became eager with the prospect of finally discovering the final component of her grand scheme. Who shall be your ever hero? Ever hero? No, no. It's too soon. Not yet. Not ready. No hero shall rise. All is lost. He fell back into his private delirium. My love... You must bring forth the savior. You must. Very tired. Tired and weak. My time gone. Past all alone. So alone. Wanted you. Be with you. He gasped for breath. So very tired. We will travel beyond the realms of the three heavenly rings and visit all of the seven heavens, but you must do this one last small thing to keep the great balance. You must let the ever-hero rise. Aetanos tried to lift his head, but couldn't. He breathed out a ragged sigh. Tell me, who is the next ever-hero? Give me a name. The Grandmaster? Nasulu? No, no, nor masters. Aetinus was fading in and out of consciousness. Not the Grand Master, nor the Fifteen Masters? Uh, an acolyte? From which of the Four Orders? Seca pressed. My song? No longer heard. Too many bright lights? Now dark. His words drifted into the air. 
Eitanas moved his head, but then stopped and tilted it to one side. Maybe one in a sky filled with stone. We'll listen. Stop playing your games. Who shall hear? Who is listening? A name. I must have a name. Sick, I was losing your patience. Names, yes, uh, names. He will be called the Mountain Climber. Pillar Dancer. The Unarmored One. The Open Palm. Happy you are here. Must sleep so very tired. Watch over me. He gasped for another breath. His body shuddered. Then he was still. Seca looked at Aetinos with disbelief. She had thought he would finally have her answer, but no, more riddles. Could he see through her glamour all this time? Was he playing her for a fool? The paradox of this puzzle was profound. She would like nothing better than to eliminate Aetinos and everyone connected to him, especially his meddlesome monks. But she could not touch them until she knew who would be chosen to be the next ever hero. At least now she knew who the next ever hero would not be. Grandmaster Nusulo and the fifteen masters would be removed first. That was a delightful thought. But she must warn her minions already in the mortal realm that no other monk was to be harmed. When she had the individual she needed, then they would all die. Seca left the cell. There was nothing more she could get from Aetinos today. She went to the chamber that housed a scrying pool. Reflected light rippled across the inner walls of the small room and bathed the ice queen in an eerie glow. Seca dipped her fingers into the thin layer of slush sitting at the surface of the bowl. The spell of divination was a mere command. Show me. Blurred images in the slush coalesced and became clear. She watched events unfold across familiar regions in the abyss. A wave of fire moved towards Gathos. It was distant now, but its destination was obvious. She curled her lips in anger, and deep shadows lined her face from the light of the bowl. Time was mocking her. Get me, Osiax! Seca yelled, her anger seethed in her cold heart. Lord Osiax raced to the chamber. Seca could hear his footsteps stomping as he approached. Make no mistake, that beast will never sneak up on anyone, she said into the bowl of slush. My queen, what is your wish? Osiax bowed before entering the chamber. This vander vexes me. He is nothing. I should have destroyed the red devil the last time he thought to flex his might, she lamented. But now he marches with impunity across the abyss. Has he truly grown that powerful? Impossible. Allow me to unleash the Frost Legions. I shall crush this pretender and bring you his head to mount on the gates of Furia Keep. We shall avenge the loss of Lord Ausdios, Osiak said. Lord Osiak's rage was equal to her own when it came to matters concerning the Sisfander. Osiak's was a demon lord of the highest order, and the perceived loss to her lesser devil, such as Sisfander, during their first encounter, was a dark blemish on his ruthless legacy. But now it seems Sisfander's power and his station had grown considerably. Lord Osiak's means nothing to me. He was an annoyance at best. Seca looked back to his scrying pool. Why would it not reveal to her the answers that eluded her? He must have a shadow patron. He must, no matter. I have pushed him back before with less, and now that I have the great monk, well, things will be different. Gatha shall remain a realm of ice and frost. My queen, I implore you, let me empty the garrisons of Furia Keep. His horde is naught but fire fiends and lesser demons. I will crush him. Seca turned away from the scrying pool in disgust. She would not lose everything she had accomplished, especially now that she was remarkably close to solidifying her eminence in the abyss. This fander grows in strength, claiming whatever soul energy he can from the demon lord he vanquishes, Seca said. She tapped her fingers together. All of our forces may truly be needed to defeat him. 
But now is not the time for hasty decisions. A full engagement with Sysvander would leave Gathos open to attack. I can think of several greater devils waiting for their chance to strike. She turned back to Osiax. The time is almost ripe for the next ever hero to arise. I can hear it in the mumblings of that old fool chained to the wall. Precise planning and cunning shall prevail over brute force, my handsome beast. The scrying pool rippled with new energy. Seca skimmed her hand over the frigid water. Ah, Sestra reports. The sorcerer Malgris has been swayed. He blindly assumed that by summoning me to the mortal realm, he will also forever bind me to his will. Such hubris. Though I will become his slave for a time, the shackles of his will should not be hard to break. She chuckled with sinister glee. <laughs> It will not be long now. The Amerinthian barrier has yet to be tested by one of your ancient blood. This is a dangerous plan, Osiak said. And I am a dangerous devil, Seca replied. 8. Kasai The morning air carried the first chill of the season. Twenty-three monks gathered in the central square. They were sleepy faces and rubbed the soreness out of their stiff limbs. Master Dorhe and Master Shogar spoke quietly in the pebbled courtyard, while Master Kunshin surveyed the faces of the assembled monks. All had participated in yesterday's tournament. Many were bruised and bandaged, but all stood at attention, awaiting his instructions. Kasai saw Jaresko in the mix. The underpart of his eyes was colored purple and his nose was covered in white bandages. I know how that feels. Kasai sighed. The left side of Kasai's face was just as swollen and bruised. It was tender to the touch, but the real pain come from the fact that his brothers knew we had thrown the fight with Daku. They just don't understand him, Kasai said to himself. Kasai remembered arriving at the monastery alone and afraid. He was six years old. A week earlier, he had witnessed the death of his mother to unspeakable things. His father had abandoned them both when their need was most dire. But everyone at the monastery had a tale of hardship, or else they wouldn't be here. Kasai had never felt so sad and hollow inside. He had stood in the middle of this same courtyard, surrounded by monks of all ages during their morning exercise. He wasn't sure what he was supposed to do. All he could see was this orange, orange, and more orange. He started to cry when another boy sided up to him. Just do it like this, the boy had said. He showed Kasai the proper movements for each exercise. Kasai followed the boy's lead. I'm Daku, the boy said. He had a black eye and a puffy lip, but that didn't seem to bother him at all. I'm Kasai Shu. Don't worry, kid. I know how it feels. Stick with me. I'll watch your back, Daku said. He narrowed his eyes as he looked at the other monks. You can't trust them. The presence of Daku in his life filled the void left by the loss of his parents. Daku was like an older brother and best friend rolled into one. No matter what Daku did, Kasai would defend him. He was a loyal friend. Kasai gently touched the bruise on his face. Stung. Or my brothers are right, and I am an idiot. Kasai heard Master Kunshin clear his throat. The rest of the monks stopped talking. Brother Daku, please step forward. Master Kunshin said. The sunrise bridge on the fifth cliff of Montu's Peak requires attention. You will lead your brothers to the bridge, repair it, and return to the monastery before nightfall. You are the captain of this expedition. The decisions are yours to make. The successful completion of this assignment and the safety of your brothers falls to you. Thank you, Master Kunshin. I will not fail, Daku said. He bowed low to each master, then turned to the monks behind him. Gather your tools. Our mission is to repair the Sunrise Bridge and return before the fall of night. We shall not fail in either of those two objectives. The group passed the main gates of the monastery and moved down into the wooded area of the mountain. Daku took the lead, as was his honor and right. Kasai followed next in line, then Giamo and Rusuno. The rest of the monks trailed behind in a winding but orderly line along a path through the woods. You know, leading an expedition like this is crucial to attaining the rank of master. I'll bet I'll be the youngest master monk at Ordu.
Nakoo said. He talked as if nature itself was listening to his every word. I put my money on Kasai, Cannonball said. Master Dorier and Master Sugar, watch him. They talk. Only because he's always late to meditation, countered Daku. I've been at the monastery for almost all my life. I wonder what the outside world is like now, Rizuno said. He grabbed a dead twig overhanging the path. It snapped from its branch. The masters talk about the past and the future, but never about what is happening now. He tossed the stick casually into a patch of ferns. I'm sure it's all the same. Crops are planted in the spring and harvested in the fall. The rainy season comes and goes. Sunshine warms the valley in summer and snow blankets the land in winter, Kasai said. The day was warming. The air was fresh, but had the taste of oncoming rain. Kasai took a glance through the trees. The bits of sky he could see was blue and cloudless. Nothing to worry about, he thought. How oh, very poetic, Daku said. There is more to life than what you read in books, Kasai. It's not all about falling leaves and soaring eagles. He moved his arm in grand gestures, mimicking the way Kasai spoke. Oh, here we go again. The coup is going to school us on the merits of a powerful punch and a swift kick, Cannonball said. I'm talking about women, but I don't expect you to know much about them. Okay, Brother Smooth, Rizona said. All hail, Brother Smooth, master monk and lover of women, added Cannonball. Kasai could not suppress a chuckle. Brother smooth. That was perfect, because Daku was anything but smooth. He was rough around every edge. That's right. I knew plenty of women before I came to this dismal place. There's no doubt, Cannonball said. Kasai looked back at Rosono. He was rolling his eyes in disbelief and whistled the sound of a rock being thrown into the air. Tell him, Kasai. He knows I'm telling the truth. Plus, I'm the captain. You have to listen to what I say. Come on, you two, knock it off. Leave Captain Smooth alone, Kasai said. Rizona and Cannonball burst into laughter. Daku only scowled. Kasai had a feeling he would pay for that playful jab later. The monks followed the path through the thick woods. Kasai always liked this time of year, especially when he could walk outside the monastery walls. The trees were just starting to change color. It reminded him of younger days when he raced through the forest surrounding his small village. I wonder if this is what it's like to be a traveling monk, Rosono said. Where do you think they send us when we are ready to leave the monastery? We are closer to the kingdom of sun than all its jungles and bugs and hidden things. Yet, history says the kingdom of Baroque is typically most in need of guidance. Prideful and ambitious family clans race their swords first and find reasons later. It is a land of war. Rizona was a natural worrier and never stopped calculating his odds of success or failure. I don't think it matters where they send us. We must help where we can and protect those in need. Everything is the same in the eyes of the boundless, Kasai said. Ugh, you sound more like Master Sugar every day, Rizona said. Untrue, Kasai gave Rizona a friendly shove. Hey, Rizona said. He rubbed his shoulder. The first thing I'm going to do is find myself a real woman, Daku said steering the conversation back to him. Like you would know what to do if you found one, Cannonball quickly chimed in. I'm very experienced, Daku said. He raised a thumb to his chest. Yeah, right. You were, what, seven, maybe eight when you arrived at Ordu? Cannonball said. Ten. I was ten. That's plenty old enough. I found an old scroll in the library that said laying with a woman will keep you from the boundless. That's why we are kept way up in the mountains, away from them. Where it is safe, Rizona said. But that can't be true, can it? The priestesses of Aetinus are cloistered in temples in all the major cities, Kasai said. I'm sure exposure to women does not hinder one from reaching the boundless. We are here at Ordu because this is where we must be. Master Kasai has all the answers today, Daku said. He kicked a rock on the path, sending it hard into a larger rock off to the side. Please tell us, great master, where will your first stop be once you are freed from our monastery's hallowed walls? The city of Gethem is closest to us in Barokia. There you will find the Temple of Illumination, as well as many dimly lit brothels. I'm sure Kokal will have more action. There's a reason it's called the City of Spires. <laughs> Which will it be? Meditation for your mind or pleasure for your body? 
I hadn't thought about it, Kasai said, which of course was a lie. He had thought about it a lot. He wondered what it would feel like to receive a kiss from a girl, but not one from his mother or an awkward kiss from an overly friendly neighbor. He meant a real kiss on the lips from someone he liked. Was there some kind of ritual or courtship that happened first? Did one kiss in public? Did one ask first? He had no idea. He had seen his parents kiss before, but they were married. Must you be married first? It all seemed very confusing and frustrating. He fantasized about living in a small village by a wide river. He was older in the vision, like how he remembered his father. He had a small home of his own in a clearing surrounded by tall pine trees. The fishing from the river was plentiful, and a vegetable garden provided in the spring and summer months. A woman stood as a silhouette in the doorway of his small home. She had long, dark hair that flowed gracefully down her back. Lazy gray smoke rose from the chimney. He could smell carrot and potato stew simmering over the fire. It was a quiet life and filled with happiness. The image shifted abruptly. The smoke turned black as night and poured out of the doorway and windows. Tongues of fire leaped from the rooftop. He raced to the house, but the woman was gone, consumed by the darkness. The dream shattered. Ah, Kasai said abruptly. Kasai? You okay? Risona said. What? Yes, of course. Kasai shook himself back to the present. He wasn't sure kissing girls even mattered. His life was devoted to the monastery of Urdu. It was better that way. I would probably meditate. Ha! <laughs> I knew it. Kasai, the stupid monk, Daku said, never willing to take a chance. Yes, that's me. Kasai remained quiet for a time. He walked with his brothers, but stopped listening to their conversation. He vaguely heard Daku ramble on about the spiral kick he had mastered. Kasai was relieved. He didn't like talking about himself so much. He was happy Daku had enough to say for both. Daku stopped the group. The path had snaked toward the edge of the cliff. Over the side, and six thousand feet below, was the Sunrise Bridge. It was a sheer drop. Okay, this is the spot. This should be an easy climb. I don't want anyone falling behind, Daku said. The monks had been trained to find minute imperfections along smooth surfaces. The skill allowed them to scale what appeared to be unscalable. They moved with the precision and ease of rock spiders, scampering over the polished rock. One by one, they slipped over the edge and climbed down the cliff wall. The descent was relatively easy. The sun was high and provided plenty of light to see the big jugs of rock ideal for hand and footholds. The work to repair the bridge was not complicated. To his credit, Daku managed the repairs efficiently, though most of the work was more physical toil rather than anything requiring finesse. He organized the monks into smaller groups, each with a task. Old and rotten wood was replaced with new planks. A more durable rope was added to the underside of the bridge to allow for more weight. The work was completed within a few hours. Daku was pleased, mostly with himself. The quick completion of the repair work would ensure he returned to the monastery well before nightfall. A commendation would follow, and a new tattoo of power added to his arm. Gather your things, we're going back, Daku said. He grabbed a thick protrusion of rock above his head and started to climb. No rest for the weary, so the saying goes, Kasai said. He started his ascent and quickly caught up to Daku. Kasai noticed the air tasted wet. He glanced over his shoulder to see dark, angry clouds rumbling in the distance. They were coming closer. A storm is coming, Kasai said. Yes, of course. What of it? Daku said. We won't beat it to the top. We must take the route of the winding snake. Today is the first scaling test for some of the younger brothers. When those clouds burst, it will not go easy for them. That route is too long. We will not make it back to the monastery before dark. They will be fine. Daku countered. Just for once, could you think of someone other than yourself? You sound like fat Giamo. If the Boundless holds such trial for the young ones, so be it. They must learn the world is not always sunshine and warm breezes. Master Kunshin said return before nightfall. Daku turned to the horizon. The skies will hold. Kasai watched the progress of his brothers. They were keeping pace. A feeling of pride came over him. He knew they were all just as sore as he was from the previous day's tournament, but all pushed on without complaint. 
He was proud to be part of such an honorable brotherhood. Kasai saw that two of the youngest brothers had fallen behind. Their movements were slow and overly cautious. They were preoccupied with the coming storm. Brothers, make haste. We do not want you caught on the mountainside with this weather. Kasai watched the progress of the storm clouds with dismay. They rolled and tumbled in massive gray waves. Bright sheets of heat lightning flashed within the billowing darkness. The wind kicked up. Kasai shielded his eyes from the dust and debris. A light spattering of rain covered the mountain as a low rumble of thunder rolled over them. Then the storm came fast. Rain fell hard in fat drops. Daku, the rope. It's time, Kasai said. Daku's face darkened in the dimming light. Afraid of little water, Kasai? The jugs are big and meaty along this pitch. The young lynx brother, Kasai pointed below. The two young monks were well behind the main group. Stop worrying. This section is basic climbing. Daku grabbed a big jug with one hand and hung like a monkey from a branch. The wind turned him one way and then the other. Kasai watched the younger monks struggle. The fear is upon them. It will steal their strength. Daku shook his head. They will make it. Stop mothering them. He continued climbing. Kasai knew the role of the leader was everything to Daku. He had no desire to take it away from his friend. But Daku was blind to the greater need of the group. He was following the assignment to its defined conclusion, regardless of the safety of his brothers. Flexibility through circumstance created a foundation of leadership. Not this. Daku held tight to a different lesson, one he learned in the rough alleys of the coastal city of Otoloto before he arrived to Ordu. The strong survive and the weak perish. There was no middle ground. Daku glared back at Kasai as if hearing his thoughts. Did he think this was a challenge to his authority? Daku's eyes bore into Kasai for a moment more. Then he smiled, albeit reluctantly. Fine. The rope, then, if it will stay your worrisome nagging. Daku took the coiled rope from his back. He secured one end around his waist and lowered the rest. Listen up. I'm lowering a rope. Attach it to your sash and then let the remainder fall to the next. Be quick. The monks worked efficiently, and soon the last brother had tied off. Happy now, old mother, Daku said. I will be when we crest the plateau. I'll wait until the younglings catch up. I'll tie on last. Daku just peered upward. He grabbed another handhold and resumed his climb. Just hurry up. Kasai wedged his torso into a wall crevice at his back. It was a useful technique to rest his arms and legs. One by one, his brothers climbed past. Each acknowledged him with a thankful nod. Kasai looked out into the horizon. A silver-blue light illuminated the air and everything it touched. The trees far below looked like miniature toys rather than the soaring pines of the forest. It was beautiful to behold, even with the rain and oppressive gloom of the storm clouds overhead. It is a beautiful land, one worthy of protection. Kasai heard the words in his head. It was the same voice that spoke to him during his trial on the pillars. Was it his conscience speaking to him, or... Was this something else? Not just an idiot, monk, but a crazy one, too, he chuckled. Let's go, you two. I'm getting soaked, Kasai called down to his brothers. They were just below the lip of a nearby outcropping. The rope was taut and rubbed over the rock's sharp edge. Two hands reached over the lip, seeking purchase, and two more followed. The hands grabbed a hold of meaty jugs, and Kasai felt relieved. This was the last challenge the younglings would face alone today. The rest of his brothers were already waiting at the next pitch. The rope was only so long. I'll tie off with these two. We'll catch up, Kasai yelled. He dislodged his body from the fissure and took the coil rope from his back. The first youngling to climb onto the narrow rock shelf was Brother Maru. Kasai liked him. He was a thinker and always had curious questions for the masters. Kasai smiled. Not that the masters ever straightforwardly answered anything. Maru knelt to give his fellow brother a hand up onto the ledge. It was Brother Hondu. Kasai didn't know him as well, but that didn't matter. They were his brothers at the monastery, and Kasai considered them part of his family now. The younglings looked up at Kasai with faces filled with gratitude and waved the two monks to him. Didn't I say I was getting wet? Coming, Brother Kasai, Maru said. Be quick, the voice boomed in his head. The mountain shuddered. A sharp slab popped from the cliff wall and shattered above Kasai's head. He wedged himself back in the crevasse, just as a large boulder flew past his face, followed by a shower of smaller rocks. 
The boulder clipped the ledge holding Maru and Hondu. The young monk's eyes grew wide as the ledge collapsed beneath them. The safety rope snapped. Kasai watched everything fall away in shimmering slow motion. He instinctively locked his legs into the crevasse and thrust the rest of his body toward his brothers. His hands darted out, but he was too far away. He missed both by a long shot. Kasai watched in horror as Maru and Hondo dropped with the rest of the ledge. Daku, stop, Kasai yelled out. Brothers have fallen. What, Daku said. We lost Maru and Hondo. We must climb down and see if they are still alive. Kasai shouted above the noise of the pelting rain and boisterous wind. The storm was getting worse by the moment. Kasai somehow remembered a childhood story of Aetanos, braving the fury of a mountain to rescue the chicks of a rare crest eagle. When he first heard the story, Kasai envisioned himself being that brave. Now that it was his reality, he wondered at his foolish childhood desires. Kasai, we must continue, Daku cried out. We're wasting time. Night time will be upon us soon. I'll go, Kasai yelled back to the group. You'll do no such thing, Daku barked back. Continue climbing. They're gone. Don't be a hero. Water ran down his face. His robes were heavy on his back. Maybe Daku was right. There's no sense risking my neck if they're already dead. Kasai immediately regretted the thought. What if Maru and Hondo were alive but hurt? One did not remain connected to the boundless by forsaking those who trusted in you or needed you. Courage, the voice spoke softly. They live. I am not my father's son, he said into the rain, unsure as to why. Was he hoping for confirmation? The voice in his head remained silent. Kasai shut his voice above the wind. Daku, take the group back. I will fetch the fallen. Go! His voice was filled with command. We'll all climb down and search together. Hold there! Kasai recognized Jurescu's voice. Leave him! Daku yelled above the howling winds. One life or three is not balanced with the lives of twenty. We climb to the monastery, now. They are our brothers! Jurescu shouted back. We cannot leave them to the storm! Must I teach you another lesson, Juresco? Master Kunshin decreed I am captain, not you and not Kasai. He disobeyed my direct order. He made the group weak. We must live with that shame. He's your friend. Does that mean nothing to you? Continue climbing, Juresco. I won't repeat myself. The coup hoisted himself up to another handhold and resumed his climb. Kasai heard every word. That's just great, Kasai said. He scanned the area where he had last seen the younglings. There, he saw a speck of orange on a ledge below. Kasai went fast. He practically fell rather than climbed from one handhold to the next. Maru was flat on his back. He was still alive, at least Kasai thought so. The rope connecting Maru to Hondo was snagged on a rock higher up on the wall. It was all that kept Hondo from falling to his death. Kasai lowered himself to the ledge. Maru had a large lump on his forehead, and his face was cut and bleeding. Honda remained suspended in air only by the grace of the rope. He moaned in pain each time his body swayed into the unforgiving mountainside. There are better ways to get attention, Kasai said. The levity in his voice was not seen in his eyes. Kasai grabbed the rope and pulled Honda onto the ledge. Honda's leg was broken. He would not be able to climb on his own. Faith in me, the voice said. The fury of the storm was directly overhead. Rain fell in cutting sheets. Small waterfalls drained the excess to the distant ground below. Kasai absentmindedly stood to relax his legs. A gust of wind almost pushed him off the ledge. His stomach lurched. Not smart, he said. A flash of lightning lit the entire valley. A thunderous boom followed. The cliff wall shook, sending more rocks tumbling past them. It seemed as if the mountain was purposely trying to shake the three monks from its skin, like unwanted pests. Nine. Shiverig. Shiverig marched down a rough-hewn stone corridor in Volcarum Keep. Many of the torches were unlit, though he knew his way. His irritation flared at the lack of proper lighting. A man should know every inch of the keep he holds. His late father had schooled him in younger days. Malachi, do you mean for me to go blind? 
Fix this. I want more light. Of course, my duke. Malachi hurried to catch up. He cleared his throat. <clears throat> Interesting that the king still advocates negotiating peace with the north, Malachi said. Don't provoke me. I know what he's doing. The royal army sits in Quagal. My associates from Raklach Fortress inform me that the king has opened talks of peace with Malchris. The fool had long enjoyed the sound of his own voice, Shiverick said. These talks will bear no fruit. The man is out of his depth. The threads of the great tapestry of life are woven together in minute details. Look too closely, and one is driven mad by the complexity. Look from afar, and the secrets of the realms are revealed. The Lord of Change has provided an opportunity to seize power. All who follows the false light of Aetonos shall your fall in ruin, Malachi said. Malachi's devotion to the prophet more bordered on fanatical. Shivering word at the east, in which his typically level-headed Arshvashim could spin into fits of religious fervor. He couldn't care less about this man more, who deemed himself the liaison to higher powers. Shivering had no time for delusional misfits with fairy tale visions of the supernatural. Sword and shield, blood and honor, these were the things of value to the Duke. Calm yourself, Malachi, there is much work to do. I want the spiritual support from the Temple of Illumination. The transition of power will be easier for the people to accept when the deity of favor is on our side. And for most of Barokia's nobles, that still means Aetonos. If Grandmaster Nisula does not comply, he must be removed, Malachi said matter-of-factly. But not before we know if he will join us or not. I'd have him on our side rather than dead. The time of Aetonos is at its end. His flock will fade or be slaughtered. It is all the same in the eyes of Moor. Grandmaster Nisula will be consumed by the fire of the purge, like all non-believers. Shivering stopped fast. He grabbed Malachi by the shoulder and spun the slight man to face him. I care not which demigod, god, or shining spirit holds sway over the hearts of the people of Barokia. Faith and devotion to absent deities is a weakness that can be exploited. No more, no less. You may dismiss Aetonos and his followers as no longer relevant, but the Grand Master of the Seventh Heaven is not to be dealt with lightly. The old man is odd, but I won't underestimate him. I'm not enough of a fool to think he is as feeble as he looks. Do not let your fanatical obsession cloud your judgment. I will not be denied my birthright to the throne of Barokia. Malachi's shifty eyes gleamed in the half-light of the sputtering torches. My duke, I have given the challenge of the Grand Master considerable thought. I believe I have found an interesting solution. She will appreciate the endeavor of converting him to your cause. Be mindful of your steps, Malachi. I'm growing weary of the dubious company you keep of late. I don't trust her. Malachi gave a short bow to Shivery. Yes, my lord. Now, what do you know of the monk, Ito Vilish? Can he be moved to support my cause? Malachi nodded his agreement. Yes, Ito Vilish is a good choice to replace Nussel. He is a favored disciple of Moore. Moore? Interesting. How can the temple allow this? Shivery was genuinely surprised. All worships are welcome to the Temple of Illumination. The absurdity of having two opposing forces under one roof is beyond me, Malachi scoffed. But such are the mysteries of Nusul. Will he follow? Shivrik said. All men conform to the desires of others until their mutual goals become unaligned. Ita Village is ambitious. He grows impatient to bring the way of more to the masses. That is his lever. Pull it, and you shall pull him along with you. Shivrik pondered Malachi's assessment for a moment. My preference is to keep Nusulo in place, but do what must be done to ensure Vilish is with us as well. Invite the Grand Master back to the keep. I want to see if we can pull his levers first. A page escorted the Grand Master Nusulo and his young attendant into a large but private audience chamber. Two of Shivrik's guards remained at the door. Waves of heat billowed into the room from a fire blazing in a grand hearth along the wall. The keep has no shortage of heat, Nasula murmured. If you please, my lord, there are refreshments, the page said. 
He directed the monks to large tables set for a feast. Candles burned brightly above platters filled with roasted meats and colorful fruits from across Barocchia. Pitchers filled with dark wine were placed evenly between the trays on the table. The duke shall be along momentarily. The page bowed and left the room. Servants stationed at the walls came forward and pulled back plush seats for the monks. I shall stand, thank you, the Grand Master said. He and his attendant remained standing. Shivering and Malachi entered the room from the east door. The small figure walked with them. The figure was cloaked in the deep purple and rose colors of how Shiverick and remained a shadow amongst shadows. Gentlemen, my apologies for keeping you waiting, Shiverick said. I've been busy with the mobilization of troops at the king's pleasure. Please be seated and refresh yourselves. The monks remained standing. It was to be a face-off then, thought Shiverick. He calmed his rising irritation. The Grand Master was playing a losing game. Duke Shiverick, we have returned at your request. I hope that you are ready to assume your role as protector of the land. It is time to perch Gethem of its current sorrow, Missoula said. Grandmaster's voice was soft but direct. Yes, thank you for coming on such short notice. We have much to discuss. I'd like you to reconsider your position on my request to assume control of the five armies. The support of the Temple of Illumination will sway the favor of the lords and force King Conrad to return military leadership to House Shiverick. My promise in return shall be to rid the land of this unfortunate plague of depravity, and then we can begin to rebuild this great realm of ours. I'm sure the construction of more monasteries will be beneficial to your followers. The Grand Master became thoughtful. Shivering was sure the old man was working through new location where he spread the word of Athens to the far reaches of the realm. And when you once more control the full military might of the kingdom, what then? Where does the ambition of Duke Garen Shiverick end? He's a clever old man, Shiverick thought. I meant only to extend the reach of the temple's message to the people of Barokia, or perhaps even beyond our borders, Shiverick said. But of course there are other endeavors one might consider. Many nobles agree a stronger Barokia would be a welcome change to our status in the Three Kingdoms. Borders could be extended, and we could establish more favorable trade agreements with the southern kingdom of Sunne. The vast jungles hold many natural resources that would benefit Barokia's growth. My armies would march on Rackless Fortress and eliminate the threat from Malgris in the north. I see prosperity for Barokia. Let King Conrad sit on his throne. He will reap the rewards of my toils. This is a familiar territory for him. I only wish for the security of the people of our realm. The Grand Master listened intently, then slowly shook his head. No, Duke Shiverick. Your grand words do not mirror the flow of your movements. I sense a taint within the air that surrounds you. It is much fouler than the smell of charred flesh and decaying corpses littering the squares. The sweet perfume of Gethem has changed to a maleficent odor. I fear something wicked has taken hold of this city, and now I see its roots have been allowed to grow deep. Missoula's eyes shifted to the hooded figure, then back at Shiverick. You are mistaken, Shiverick said. We both know I am not. Duke Shiverick, you must never be allowed to command the five armies, even in the king's name. You will use the fear of a northern invasion to create a defensive barrier around Quokal. Your control over the great houses would grow by leveraging military protection to the outer estates. It is a short step from there to a coup for the throne. For that is your goal, is it not? To supplant the king and assume the throne for yourself? Masula looked questioningly at the duke. Shivering clapped his hands together in applause. I'll never understand how you monks do that clever trick. Truth saying, do you call it? But, yes, to your point, I will have the temple's support in this matter. I will not ask again. I see things are worse than I originally suspected. The temple of illumination does not involve itself with matters of politics. Our position remains unchanged. However, your path will thrust the great houses into civil war, causing the death of thousands. This we cannot condone. The temple will no longer remain silent. Shivering was about to speak, but held his tongue. He could see the Grand Master had made his decision. For the way of the world is through change. Those who cannot or will not alter their ways must be removed. So says the prophet Moore.
Malachi said. The Grand Master ignored Malachi's threat. His eyes were locked on shivering. He spoke as a father would a wayward son. I do not understand, Garen. Your family has sired many of Barokia's greatest heroes. How did one of the brightest stars fall so deep into darkness? This was the moment. Once he stepped forward down this path, there was no turning back. Was he sure? Shivering paused to collect his thoughts. His answer was clear in his head. Barokia must be strong. I am sorry to hear you will not listen to reason, old father. But I will not sit idle and watch the kingdom of my forefathers crumble to dust. He nodded to Malachi. It is time we introduce our guest, Malachi said with glee. May I present Sestra from the frozen court of Seca, the archdevil of Gallus. Sestra removed her hood and let the cloak fall to the ground. A lithe and supple body stepped out of the purple puddle of cloth. Her naked body glistened in the firelight. Her thin, almond-shaped eyes tapered upward at their sides. A feral smell emanated from her demonic pores as a long serpentine tail grew from her backside. It swayed with a feline twitch. Finally, Sestra purred. She lunged forward at the young aide at the Grandmaster's side. Her hand shot out and tore through his throat. Sestra then vaulted over Nasulu. A thick braid of jet-black hair uncoiled down her back. An eerie innocence filled her laughter as she landed softly across the room. Nasula flashed into action. Gone was any resemblance of a tired old man content to spend his remaining days in quiet meditation. The Grand Master of the Seventh Heaven spun to face the demon. He crouched in a defensive posture as an aura of blue radiance formed around his body. Shiverick felt the air in the room change. The hairs on his arms rose off his skin. Then a burst of energy rippled past him that felt like a wave of electricity. It rattled the contents of the table and knocked over the empty wine goblets. The Grand Master held one hand out straight against the demon's advance. His other hand was curled at his side in a fist ready to strike. Both glowed white hot. Shivrig watched the Grand Master with fascination. He had heard of the mystical martial arts of the monks of the Four Orders, but he had never seen one of them in action. Real combat was the most accurate measure of a man. Sestra wore a wolfish grin. She approached the Grand Master with the ease of a streetwalker. She oozed with seduction as a slight hip swayed with each step. So, this is the pride of Aetanos, Sestra mocked. Her magenta-hued eyes sparkled with intensity as they caught the white light burning from Nasula's hand. I know not how you came so far without being detected, demon, but I see you now, Nasula said. Sestra brought a slender index finger to her lips and kissed the onyx ring upon it. She then wagged the finger side to side. My mistress Seca provides. Sestra ran toward the Grand Master in a blurring, zigzag course. Nasula held his position. He brought his clenched fist up to mirror his outstretched palm just before she crashed into him. A force of air slammed into the demon. Sestra was tossed across the floor. She tumbled into a roll and rose like an indignant cat. You have doomed yourself, Duke Shiverig, Nasula said, keeping his eyes fixed upon the demon. His manner was completely calm, almost peaceful. Join us, Malachi yelled. Join the new power of the Three Kingdoms. The change of war is upon you. Decide. No answer came from the Grand Master. Sestra sauntered toward the monk again. She wiped away a touch of blood from her nose with the back of her hand. She raised her eyebrow and gave Nasula a bit of a smirk. The air shimmered behind her, and Shiver watched in amazement as bat-like wings sprouted from her back. They were the color of a moonless night and unfurled like a virgin fern. She took to the air. Nasula followed her movement as she flew above him. His arms slowly moved through different defensive gestures in anticipation of her next attack. It came quickly. Sestra dove toward him like a bird of prey. She shrieked as talons sprouted from her fingers. Her thinly shaped eyes grew wide with excitement. Nasula braced himself. He manipulated the air to form a white barrier between him and the demon. Sestra barked out a word of power that made Shivrit wince. The shield above Nasula wavered just enough for the demon to slice through it. 
She plowed into Nasul. The momentum of her impact carried both to the floor, though the Grandmaster rolled with fluid ease. They grappled together in a fatal embrace. Nasulu masterfully blocked each of the furious strikes from her hands and feet. They missed his flesh and succeeded in only tattering his robes. Nasulu struck back, but Sestra's leathery wings shielded her from his counterpunches. Sestra's strikes were wild. They grazed his skin, but she could never land a decisive blow. Soon the Grandmaster's face and hands were lined with razor-thin scratches. Somehow, Nasula managed to get to his feet under the demon. He braced himself against the floor and thrust his legs upward. Sestra was shot into the air with such force she broke through one of the overhead rafters. The splintered wood fell to the floor. Dust clouded in the air around her. Sestra leered down at the old man when it cleared. Nasula raised himself from the floor. His robes were torn, but he seemed intact. Grandmaster was a formidable opponent. Shivering was right not to have underestimated his abilities. Your dark minion will not prevail here, Shivering, Nasul said. The man seemed unfaced by the attack. You are already dead, monk, Sestra hissed. You have been kissed by my mistress, Nectar, at least a dozen times. Nasul brought his hands to his face and examined the numerous welts and claw marks. He chuckled and shook his head. You thought to defeat me with a little poison. Toxins of any kind shall not affect me, Nasula said. Now, let us finish this. The Grand Master assumed a sturdy pose. His arms circled his body as he breathed out deeply. Sestra remained in the rafters and watched. A drop of blood oozed from Nasula's nose, followed by a red gush that streamed down his face. The welts covering his body swelled like giant worms under his skin. White pus wept from the open scratch wounds on his hands. His arms dropped to his sides as if all strength had fled. Somehow the Grand Master remained standing. The cob expression on his face never changed, yet his body trembled with exertion. Sestra floated down from the rafters and stood confidently next to the monk. She leaned in close to the side of Nasula's face. Her smooth cheek brushed against his weathered skin as she whispered in his ear, As I said, my mistress provides. Shivering approached the Grand Master. Malachi was by his side like a faithful dog. This does not have to be the end, O Father. The time has come to choose, Shivering said. The Sula's eyes were filled with sadness and disappointment. Can he speak? Shivering asked the demon. Let's see, Sestra said. She thrust her claw hand deep into the Grand Master's chest. The Grand Master's mouth opened wide, but only emitted a slight wheeze. She yanked her arm from his body. Nasula fell dead to the floor. No, he cannot, Sestra said. She grinned at Shivering as her eyes bore into him, daring him to act. Shivering was tempted to throttle the little bitch. Instead, he grabbed a fistful of Malachi's robes and pulled his arch for Sheem close. A demon was not to kill the old man. He would have been a useful prisoner if he could not be swayed. You knew as well as I. The Grand Master had made his decision before entering the keep. Malachi said it was a false hope he would be swayed. Shivrick was furious. He thrust Malachi away. Sestra's bloodlust had created a massive setback to his plans. He motioned to the guards at the main door. Remove this mess and have the bodies burned. Tell no one. Shivrick would worry about the explanation for the Grand Master's disappearance later. Malachi would come up with something plausible, he hoped. Shivrick was under no delusions that the temple monks would believe him. Damn it, he yelled out into the room. Malachi was oblivious to Shivering's rage and moved closer to Sestra. You are truly a wondrous sight. Your perfect precision is a marvel. Your sanguine and seductive movements have enchanted me. Perhaps we can share more of your otherworldly delights in private, my lovely succubus? Malachi ran his hand along her shoulder. His finger traced her collarbone, then moved down toward the divide between her breasts. She looked at him, tenderly, with a smile that was coaxing and dangerous at once. One of her sharp incisors peeked out over the bottom lip and bit down at its corner. Malachi's hopes broadened. He licked his dry lips. His hand reached for her right breast. A quick flash of steel rose from Sestra's waist. Malachi's hand was sliced off at his wrist. It landed with a slap against the stone floor. A small dagger, hitherto unseen, glistened with dark blood. Touch me again, worm, and you shall lose the other, Sestra said. 
Malachi's piercing shriek bounced against the walls of the room. He dropped to his knees. His remaining hand alternated between holding his bleeding stump and trying to pick up his lost appendage. Was that necessary, demon? Shivering said through frustrated teeth. Malachi still had his uses. I don't want him dead. Sestra's lascivious smile was the only answer she gave before licking the knife clean. Be thankful my mistress did not bless the dagger as well. Shivrick turned to face the fire burning in the hearth. He sighed. This was a frustration he did not need. His mind shifted through possible contingency plans. His wartime instincts took over. First, stop the immediate bleeding. He called to the guards at the door. Get him to the healers. Perhaps something can be saved. Shivrick turned back to the fire. He nodded to himself. It's time to move my plans to the next level. I will need Vilish if I am to move on House Conrad. This was not entirely unexpected. It, it just shifted a few new pieces into play as others were removed. Shivering tried to console himself to no avail. His pieces were now scattering in a foreign wind. He walked toward the door but stopped. Sometimes it's better just to embrace the chaos, he thought. He looked over his shoulder at Sestra. Demon, a word with you. Tell me more about Sekka.